Well, I will now declare open this hearing of the Senate Environment and Communications References Committee inquiry into media diversity in Australia. I begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and pay our respects to the elders past and present. On behalf of the committee, <clears throat> I would like to welcome everybody here today. Uh, Today's hearing will be, uh, is being conducted in person. Uh, we've got a number of senators in the room um, and also via video conference. For the benefit of all participants, I'm the chair, Senator Sarah Hanson-Young, and I'm joined in the room by Senators Bragg, who is the recently appointed deputy chair, uh, and Senator Carr. Uh, welcome to you all, and uh, thank you in advance uh, for your patience with any of the technical issues. I'm not sure whether we've got any senators uh, on the line. It doesn't look like we do at this point, but they might uh, drop in throughout the day. Uh, this is a public hearing and a Hansard transcript of the proceedings is being made. The hearing is also being broadcast via the Australian Parliament House website. Before the committee starts taking evidence, I remind all witnesses in giving evidence to the committee that they are protected by parliamentary privilege. And it is unlawful for anyone to threaten or disadvantage a witness on account of evidence given to a committee. And as such, action, and such action may be treated as, by the Senate as contempt. It is also contempt to give a false or misleading, uh, to give false or misleading evidence to a committee. The committee generally prefers evidence to be given in public, but under the Senate's resolutions, witnesses do have the right to request to be heard in a private session. If a witness objects to answering a question, the witness should state the ground upon which that the objection is taken. The committee will determine whether it will insist on an answer, having regard to the ground on which it is claimed. If the committee determines to insist on an answer, a witness may request that the answer be given in camera. A request may, of course, be made at any other time. I remind all people in the hearing room to ensure your mobile phones are on silent. Those participating via video conference and teleconference are reminded to please state your full name uh, each, before you speak each time to assist Hansard. And in the meantime, and when you don't have the call, please uh, mute yourselves. Um, okay. Well, I now welcome Mr. Robert Thompson uh, of News Corporation. I understand that information on parliamentary privilege and the protection of witnesses and evidence has been provided to you. Um, good morning or good evening, Mr. Thompson. I understand it's about 7 p.m. over there. So thank you so much for giving us your time tonight. Um, I understand that uh, information on parliamentary privilege has been given to you, but if you could please uh, state your full name uh, and then I'll give you an opportunity uh, to give us an opening statement and then we'll go to questions. But thank you for making yourself available today. Thank you, Senator, and thank you to the committee. Uh, my name is Rob Deloro Thompson. I'm the Chief Executive of the School Break. Wonderful. And Mr Thompson, do you have an opening statement for us? I, I do have a relatively brief opening statement. Wonderful. And then we'll go to some questions. Thank you. And the Chair would permit. Uh, thank you. I genuinely appreciate the opportunity to be up here before you and apologise for the tyranny of time and the time. The issues with which you grapple are profound. They are fundamental, not incremental. When it comes to diversity and sustainability and efficacy, the recent publication of the Facebook files has presented challenges to legislators around the world. We are at last starting to have a more sophisticated debate about the impact of social media and the potency of digital platforms. I understand that the committee is focused on traditional media diversity, but for relevance, for residents in the future, there needs to be a collective focus on contemporary creation, distribution, and consumption patterns. I left Australian Shores in early 1985, but have vivid memories of my early days in journalism, beginning as a copy boy in Melbourne at the Herald, having been born in rural Victoria, Carumbri, in a pub, to be precise. Fair to say that the reach now is somewhat broader and more international, given that it encompasses, among other properties, Abercollins Books, Realty.com, The Wall Street Journal, The Times, the Sun and Housing.com, a digital property company in India. The harsh truth is that our traditional newspapers have become a significantly smaller proportion of News Corp. And the words digital disruption and big digital are both euphemisms. In Australia, print newspaper sales, unfortunately, have suffered a pronounced fall in the past decade. There has been a significant shift in power, influence and profitability from the creators of news content to the distributors of news content. That shift was already evident when I was asked to give evidence as editor of the Times to the House of Lords in 2007 about the fate of media. But the social, cultural, political and commercial consequences have become increasingly acute. For us, 
we could not go gentle into that good night. That there is more diversity in potential news sources is indisputable. The Guardian, the BBC and the Daily Mail, publications against whom we compete, are now widely available in Australia, to an extent unimaginable in the 1980s. Proliferation is not the issue, and yet publications are struggling to survive, even as their audiences and potential audiences have grown exponentially. That is why the Australian media code is so crucial and has served as an inspiration to countries around the world. It is a tribute to the Australian Parliament, and can I, I can affirm without fear of contradiction that its worth is recognised in London, Washington, Paris, Rome, Brussels and beyond. That legislation, your legislation, and the ACCC's digital reports will be cornerstones of global content policy far into the future. While on the subject of diversity, it would surely be remiss of me not to mention the inherent diversity within News Corp. The Times and the Wall Street Journal have widely different policy positions, and within the same London building, the Times and Sunday Times often disagree with each other. The Times were strongly in favour of Remain, and the Sunday Times argued for Brexit. That diversity echoes through the company and is clearly present at Harbour Collins, which publishes Ilhan Omar and Ben Shapiro and the Dalai Lama. We recently reached a landmark agreement with the estate of Dr. Luther King Jr. to publish his archives across the world, including in all formats and all languages. Across News Corp, across the globe, there are contrasting concepts, diverging views, a contest of ideas. It should be of concern that the contest of ideas is not cherished by all and that a movement to silence, to censor views, to shame and to ostracise has gained momentum in much of the world. We should all be wary of a seemingly insatiable quest for indignation on right and left, a whole of the theology that demonises deviation. On the environment, it is worth stressing that corporately we have pursued a policy consistent with Rupert Murdoch's statement in 2006 that the planet deserves the benefit of the doubt. We were the first large media company in the US to commit to science-based targets for carbon reduction. From 2016 to 2020, they were cut by 30%, and further reductions are well advanced. In 2011, we created what was one of the largest industrial solar products in the United States at our Dow Jones Print Centre in New Jersey. HarperCollins announced this week that it would be carbon neutral next year, and that is not just from buying carbon offices. You will have no doubt noticed the campaign ahead of the Glasgow summit by many of our papers in Australia. To be clear, the initiative came from the local editors. It is important that there be rational, rational responses to challenges. Earthsats energy is not a fuel, and working class Australians will certainly be the most vulnerable if costs rise dramatically. It's also important for the credibility of science that scientists resist the temptation to be social engineers. Neo-Malthusian <clears throat> Neo ramblings are not research. Two closing points on matters digital. Firstly, the digital ecosystem is dysfunctional. And while there is undoubted diversity, there is not yet sustainability, even in new media. Ten smart women and men could launch a news website in Birmingham, England, or Birmingham, Alabama, and no matter how clever, how canny, they would be doomed because content is not properly valued and the digital ad market lacks transparency. Secondly, the impact of so-called social media on sensibility, on personality, has to be challenged. The most brilliant software engineers in the world are making products more compelling, more compulsive, leveraging human instinct, harvesting our insecurities and our children's insecurities. The puissance of artificial intelligence is real, and that influence is growing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr Thompson. Now, I'm going to go first to uh, Senator Carr. And um, I imagine, um, Senator Bragg, you've got some questions as well, and I've got some questions, but we'll go first to Senator Carr. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Thompson, for appearing today. It's uh, much appreciated. Uh, we have been looking at the broader range of issues in regard to media diversity in this country and noticed uh, in particular the concerns that News Limited's raised with regard to the operations of the streaming platforms, uh, the online platforms, um, we've seen with Google and uh, some of the others, for instance, you've raised some concerns there. Uh, and I'm wondering if it's uh, your view that 
uh, Google, for instance, is should be, or Facebook, for instance. Let's let's take that one for example. Do you believe they should be treated? Uh, are they a publisher? Would you define them as a publisher? Senator, uh, they are a publisher. Uh, they publish information. And uh, as you well know, there was a, a recent court case in Australia uh, which found uh, a, a news organisation, uh, us, uh, responsible for comments on the Facebook site about content that may have originated uh, with News Corp but was published by Facebook. And one, one of the distinctions, Senator, is that uh, if, if people have a complaint uh, about an article and there needs to be accountability with uh, a newspaper, you, there are so many routes by which we can be held accountable. We clearly make mistakes and we should be held accountable for mistakes. But whether it's a standards editor, uh, whether it's a, a reader's editor, whether it's a corrections editor, uh, whether it's a, a, a media regulator, uh, whether it's the libel laws, which uh, in many of our jurisdictions are quite stringent, there are ways to hold uh, publishers to account. Uh, un unfortunately, uh, that's not yet the case for the big digital platforms. And specifically, how are they different in terms of the regulations that apply to Facebook in terms of th those uh, matters that apply to you as a publisher? Senator, I think there are two elements to it. One is the creation of internal mechanisms for dealing with issues. The, 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 in a good newspaper, there's a day after day, almost hour after hour, minute after minute discussion about the value of news, whether it's correct. But, and, uh, a good editor and good journalist will put together a paper that has already been reality checked. So you have that internal me mechanism, which also includes uh, the uh, ability of a reader to challenge that. Secondly, uh, what is the external mechanism for, of oversight? Both of those mechanisms are missing at the moment. So ACMA says, of course, that those platforms are beyond their reach in terms of the Australian regulations. Do you believe that they should be within the same regulatory framework in terms of ACMA that you are? So no, I think if, I, uh, if anybody operates in Australia uh, to play a role as a content provider or to make money, that that should be subject to Australian jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. Well, let's take another area that um, is of particular interest uh, to Australians, and that's the question of sport. I've been watching with some interest the development of Facebook's uh, interest in um, bidding for global uh, sports um, platforms, uh, you know, uh, events. Um, I've got here a, an article that goes back just a couple of years, but it's uh, uh, Mr. Peter Dutton, Facebook's Director of Global Sports Partnerships, was saying that they were testing the market for being able to bid for sporting um, events. Have you noticed an increasing interest in Facebook's uh, capacity and interest in bidding for sporting events in different markets? Senator, there's no doubt about their capacity. Now, there are, last time I looked, they're about 67 times larger than us. Uh, so capacity they certainly have. Uh, to be fair, it's not just Facebook. It's Amazon. It's potentially Netflix, obviously Google via YouTube. The big flat platforms obviously understand sport is compelling content. Mm -hmm. And they are experimenting in uh, different countries, in, in different leagues, different genres of sport. Uh, I have no doubt that they'll be in the Australian market uh, as buyers at some soon. So if they are likely to be entering the Australian market, because uh, the view has been up until this point that the market wasn't sufficiently large to attract them, but you think that's going to change, is, is that the proposition you're putting to the committee? Uh, that would be my instinct, Senator. I, of course, I have no knowledge of any imminent no, bid, no, but if, if you look at the, the confluence of trends, Senator, so you're thinking AFL, NRL, those types of uh, matters could be subject to uh, an interest from these types of platforms? Well, certainly, potentially. Yeah. Well, I'm just wondering, do you think it'd be appropriate that uh, the anti-siphoning laws be extended to the streaming platforms so that uh, Australians can be able to be guaranteed access to 
free to air or free access to those types of uh, sporting events, and particularly the AFL and the NRL, I would have thought would be a matter of deep concern to many Australians uh, that they have access to those. Senator, honestly, I have conflicting things on this. Subject. Oh. I, would like to be, oh. I would like them to be relaxed for us and intensified for them. Mm. Mm. Well, the point I'm getting to, I guess, is that we've had um, a very large petition sent to us Half a million Australians, it's the largest electronic petition that's been received by the Australian Parliament calling for a Royal Commission, or perhaps another way of looking, perhaps some sort of judicial inquiry into whether or not uh, the, and I, I see it, you know, appropriately, uh, whether or not the regulatory framework is in fact fit for purpose. Given what uh, we've discovered through our proceedings, that so much of the current media environment is not actually covered by the regulatory environment uh, that you said was, I thought, was the envy of the world. Uh, would it not be appropriate that that petition made up of, as I say, half a million Australians calling on this parliament to actually initiate a much broader inquiry dealing with this failure of the regulatory environment to actually deal with the actual situation in Australia at the moment? So it, it depends what the, uh, the remit of, of any uh, commission would be. Mm -hmm. What we're looking at more is how to regulate for the future mm. and not, uh, frankly, uh, to focus on the past. You, you don't want uh, a commission that's giving land planning for Pompeii. See, just that what you told us is you think that the Facebook sh should be treated as a publisher and subject to the same regulations that the rest of uh, publishers are, that the anti-siphoning type arrangements, sporting arrangements, should be subject to the same sort of arrangements everyone else is. Um, given the attitude that you take in regard to uh, news and other matters, I would have thought in this era of convergence, as you put it, uh, in, in other, other forums, that it is time to actually have a look at whether or not our regulatory framework is fit for purpose in, in to be able to meet the needs of the country into the future. Would you agree with that or not? Well, Senator, I, I think what Australia has done with, with the, the digital composition of the market, the content market, the impact on you is admirable. The question is, uh, is not a, a wholesale institutional introspection of, of Australian media. It is really, how do you deal with these new plans? But the whole, surely the whole issue of diversity does require a broader approach, given the nature of convergence at the moment. I mean, the proposition that news puts to us is that because there's all these other avenues available, there's not really a problem of diversity in this country. Uh, whereas others put to us that, of course, we've got the highest levels of media concentration in the world. And if you look at the actual, even on your own data, the major platforms are, in fact, owned by your corporation, which is a foreign corporation. Um, the level of diversity of views in terms of climate change, for instance, and I'm sure my colleagues will want to take this matter up in more detail, uh, we've seen in recent times, does not show a great deal of diversity. Every front page of every one of your tabloids has suddenly discovered the same thing at the same time. Um, there are quite substantial questions here about the level of diversity in this country, given the media concentration in, in, uh, in, in this, uh, within this country. Would you not agree? Senator, there is increasing diversity in Australia, clearly so. When you look at uh, the rise of The Guardian, BBC, the Daily Mail, the New York Times Online, the ability of Australians to access more diverse content is in What the issue is not diversity, which is consistency, that the, the new big digital players are not subject to the rules that are imposed upon the traditional players. So diversity is not an issue, consistency is an issue. Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm suggesting to you, I'm agreeing with you, it should be subject to the same regulatory environment. The question is, what regulatory environment, and that's what I'm trying to get from you, what do you think is appropriate, and to meet the current needs of this country, and whether or not, given what Australians are putting to us in terms of this petition, 
whether a, a broader Royal Commission or a, Royal, or a judicial inquiry may well be the best way of establishing that so everyone gets a chance to put their view in an appropriate manner. Uh, so I think the best is for Parliament legislation that, that covers the new big digital players. It, as I say, the issue is not diversity, it's consistency. Well, I'll come back because uh, I you know, obviously want to share there, but I'll come, I've got more to, to pursue if yes. you think. Okay, well, Thanks. I might go to Senator Bragg and then, um, and then, then I'll go to, and then I'll have some questions and then we'll go back around again. Senator Bragg. Thanks, Chair. Um, Mr Thompson, I wanted to uh, come to you on the media bargaining legislation that you mentioned in your opening statement. Um, how long did it take News Limited to do a deal uh, with Facebook and or Google under that legislation? Well, uh, Senator, it took us, in, in many respects, many years because we had been negotiating uh, for this principle, as had other publishers around. Uh, and uh, it's fair to say that the uh, Australian legislation, the, the, the imminence of it, the promise of it, uh, concentrates on it. And so, it, uh, and you will have seen from my public statements on this issue uh, in the past that it, this was not just about news corporation because it doesn't change the uh, media ecosystem for a deal to be done with a single company, even though it may happen to be us. It, it, the entire ecosystem had to change. And uh, so it was a very important part of that changing, not only in this country, but globally, because it set a precedent. Uh, because it, uh, back to Senator Carr's uh, previous observations, the world, not just Australia, is looking for ways of, of oversight of these companies, how to define them, how to define their responsibility, how to define their roles, how to define their obligations. Uh, and it's it's not unique as an issue to Australia. And so I think the work that the ACCC and Rod Sims and his team have done, the work that was done uh, within the parliament has been, been crucial. Uh, now, as for Facebook, we have a deal with Facebook uh, in Australia. We have a, a deal uh, in the US. As yet, we do not have a deal with Facebook in the UK. OK, and how would you describe... Uh working with Facebook, are they an easy company to engage with? Well, well personally, uh, I have a lot of respect for, for Mark Zuckerberg, uh, but uh, as these companies become large and successful, uh, like any company, I dare say, uh, they become more bureaucratic. Uh, and so I think sometimes uh, uh, Mark's intentions get, get lost in the bureaucracy. Uh, but they are, look, they're a, a, a powerful player, as I say, many, many times the size of of most media companies globally, not just ours. Uh, and uh, while they're certainly to be applauded uh, for the way that uh, they have, have set a precedent mm. in paying for content, the first big deal was done with us in the US. Uh, uh, there are still serious issues, and not just for media companies, uh, with algorithmic changes that can have an existential impact on, on the health of business. So, and it, it might be a small company or it might be an NGO that's dependent upon its digital branding to, to get donations so that it can perform its important work. Uh, Facebook and Google uh, can almost um, overnight undermine your digital brand equity by algorithm changes. Now, what can Australia do to make sure that it's more algorithmic transparency, AI transparency and data transparency? Those are the three key issues. Okay. Um, you may be aware that uh, being a larger company uh, puts you in a significantly better position when dealing with Facebook, um, and I'm pleased that you've been able to um, come to an accommodation with Facebook, uh, but are you aware that there are many, many uh, smaller media organisations that have had uh, no prospect of getting a deal with Facebook? Are you aware of that? I'm not aware of the details. I know that not all small Australian publishers have, have yet reached agreement. And unfortunately, that goes against what Facebook uh, told us early in the negotiations, uh, that it would involve regional publishers, community publishers, uh, because you can go back to a discussion that Mark and I had uh, in New York over two years ago, where we were uh, on stage publicly talking about a payment for news content. Uh, and 
Uh, it's the Mark's intention uh, mm. that these things done with smaller publishers. And, and as I say, I can only, only presume it's the bureaucracy uh, that stands between uh, Mark's promises uh, and the articulation of those words. Well, would you be willing to uh, raise this issue um, with Facebook, given you have a seemingly a much stronger position than many of these small, uh, diverse and often regional publications? But, Senator, given uh, the authority of this committee uh, and given that it's public, I think we have just raised the issue with Facebook. Yeah, it's terrific. Well, thanks very much. Thank you, uh, Senator Bragg. Um, Mr Thompson, uh, you've mentioned uh, already in your opening statement uh, the uh, pivot that uh, News Corp has taken on uh, climate change uh, of recent, uh, recently. Uh, you did say that um, your position on the environment, and correct me if I misheard you, but I thought it was that uh, with, under the prospect of the planet deserves the benefit of the doubt. Um, you know, I think you were, you were quoting Mr Murdoch in that. Um, I'm just wondering at what point uh, was it decided that this pivot would take place on uh, climate action? Is this something that was discussed at uh, you know, the global level uh, in your offices in New York? Was it something that has come out of the Australian realm? Uh, I'm just wondering, I'm wanting to understand uh, what the impetus of this has been. Uh, Senator, obviously uh, Glasgow is a time to concentrate minds and thinking, and that's what our local editors have done in Australia, not dictated by me or anyone else. I first heard when I read a story, somewhat accurate, somewhat inaccurate, in the Channel 9 press uh, about the plans. So it was very much uh, generated by our editors. Uh, and uh, it, it's really what we're talking about is aspiration. and. The, the, the challenge for us all is the difference between uh, aspiration and actualization. There, there's, uh, there's going to be serious discussion, serious debate, no doubt sometimes serious dispute in detail and concept. The role of government, the size of government, the role of the private sector. Uh, clearly the climate is changing and, and we have to take responsibility. But uh, idealism is laudable, but only realism will make a meaningful difference. Mm. You can understand, uh, surely, why people were surprised uh, to see such a uh, full-blown campaign uh, for climate action after seeing uh, more than a decade of climate scepticism being uh, published and promoted and uh, almost celebrated uh, across your mastheads. Senator, I wouldn't agree with your characterisation of the coverage, but uh, what I would say is that it's clear, not just in this global, that uh, Glasgow is indeed a time to concentrate minds. Mm. Um, how often has this occurred? Is this, a, um, is this a, a, a campaign like this that kind of goes across all front pages uh, in such a coordinated um, way is that? Is there other examples you can give me in relation to this? Well, I think you'd have to speak to our Australian team, Senator, because we don't have this, the same mix of papers in our global businesses. Mm -hmm. But uh, none immediately comes to mind. But I, I think at, at different times, uh, that thematically, there, there are probably uh, similar themes. But the, uh, the local editors uh, have the autonomy to, to drive these campaigns themselves. Mm. Um, We've heard uh, from a number of uh, your Australian counterparts throughout this inquiry, and I just want to put on the record that it's been um, uh, uh, it's been noted, and, and and we appreciate the amount of time and uh, uh, effort that uh, News Corp has um, given us in this inquiry. We've heard from a number. We've heard from Michael Miller. We've heard from um, uh, a number of um, reps from News Corp. Um, Everybody seems to stress the independent uh, editorial nature of your newspapers. Is, um, is that a core principle um, of News Corp? Well, Senator, there, there are differences. As I said, uh, for example, in, in England, we had the Sunday Times backing Brexit and we had the Times backing Remain for, for, for what was one of the key issues. Uh, in, in Britain in, and in Europe, and some would say for the world at that time, the two papers were ideologically at odds. Uh, 
uh, and, and that is surely evidence of a diversity of view. Mm. Um, how do we explain uh, editorial independence um, when every newspaper in the country uh, owned by News Corp carry, carried the same 16-page wraparound in relation to climate uh, a week or so ago? How did that so happen? The, the, how did that, <laughs> it happened because there was, a, there was a meeting of the local editors. They had collectively agreed uh, that they had a Glasgow that they uh, wanted to, to make an editorial statement. Uh, clearly, they must have... I, I, I haven't seen the coverage. You've probably... Um, it, it, beyond the front pages, I've certainly seen. Uh, but the, the inside pages, I, I, I haven't. Mm. Uh, but I presume uh, that the situation at each, each of the states is different. I presume as you get into the texture of the, of the coverage, when the, the situation in Queensland is different to that uh, in, in Melbourne, Melbourne different to Sydney, that, the, the demands, the imperatives for those audiences are different. I, I would, I would be surprised if there was no divergence in the the texture of that coverage. Um, well, it was definitely well organised. I mean, some of the, the the headlines and the photos were all the same, let alone uh, the content inside. Um, I'm just wondering how that marries with media diversity. And if every newspaper in the country, out of the most concentrated media. Uh, newspaper uh, market in the world c carries the first 16 pages all the same. Doesn't seem much for much <laughs> space for diversity there, does it? Well, well Senator, I, I would uh, contest your definition of diversity. Clearly, uh, about 20% of people now rely on newspapers for news, 80% don't. So I think it's about 65% of people read their mobile phones for news. Is that 65% going to be 80% in two years' time? There's a vast amount of diversity in Australia. Mm. Um, from a um, business perspective, have the big advertisers been lobbying News Corp to change their position on uh, climate, to move away from the promoters of denialism to embracing climate action? Have you... <laughs> Again, I, I would contest the characterisation of your question, but Senator, uh, I'm not aware of it, but you could certainly t speak to our team in Australia who uh, would be aware if that was the case. So n no big global advertisers have ever raised the concerns about uh, uh, News Corp's position on climate change with you? Certainly not. Mm. Um, did James Murdoch ever raise concerns with you about uh, News Corp's position on climate? Well, James has made public his views and he's entitled to Yes, but has, has he had a conversation with you about this? this were, were those comments surprising to you or was it part of a... Uh, do, were you aware? Had he discussed his concerns with the direction of News Corp in relation to climate change prior to making those public statements? James's public views well known. I think it was quite clear what James's views were and he's, as I say, quite at liberty to express them. Mm. OK. Um, uh, yes, Senator Carr. Look, uh, Mr Thompson, I'm, I'm just interested in um, this point about how decisions are made in news. And I acknowledge that there are differences between uh, some of your mastheads. I take, for instance, the Australian uh, can be distinguished from the Melbourne Herald Sun. Uh, but there are occasions when the... Uh, fleet tends to act as one. And I, well, I, I, put, I, mean, if you, I can see your, by your expression you think that's a bit odd. If I take, for instance, some major matters that characterise the last Labor government, of which I was a member, the NBN, um, vigorously opposed by n newspapers. This government's basically copped the bulk of what we've said in terms of the, the global rollout, climate change, major achievements uh, of that government, New, news, uh, this government's basically now moving to accept those positions. The difference is news strongly opposed the Labor government and, and in fact right up until very recently opposed Labor Party policy on those things, but now supports this government's position. Um, I, I could 
put to you that uh, in, in a range of matters like that, um, we're, we're seeing that the position that th this uh, government's taking um, has been a strong correl correlation with that that's taken by news. And I do acknowledge, as I say, that there are differences within the or stable, if you like. But um, I'm also struck by this, Mr Lachlan Murdoch's proposition that, that I don't tell journalists what to say or to, what to write. That's not my role. What I do, running a media organisation, is obviously, you know, work closely with the managers of those newsrooms and with the managers of those newspapers, and it's important that they get, uh, he says, uh, the uh, positioning and the messaging right. Now, that was the position that was uh, put uh, recently on Australian TV, uh, quoting Mr Murdoch. Was that, was that an accurate reflection of his view? And is that, in fact, how well, it actually operates? Well, uh, uh, so, look, clearly, as a company, uh, we have a philosophy about certain issues, about the role of markets, about the uh, And in my discussion, with editors, and if I'm in Australia, I will certainly go to the editorial floors. I come, I visit the editorial floors wherever, having been an editor in one form before sorry, a newspaper. Is it? It's, it's sorry, can you just, I'm, we're having trouble picking that up. Is that, did I, was that just me or the? Mr Thompson, are you able to speak or get a bit closer to your microphone? Sorry. Yes. Uh, is, that, is that better? I think that might be better. Thank you very Thank much, you. yes. Thank no, you. I'm sorry. If you, if, you, if you wouldn't mind um, uh, repeating what you've said to Senator Carr after he's asked you about um, Ms Lachlan Murdoch's comments in relation to getting the message right. Well, Lachlan has always made clear that he doesn't tell journalists what, what to write, and so there was clear, a mischaracterisation of, of his earlier statement. Uh, but uh, as a company, clearly we have a philosophy about individual freedom, about the role of the market, about the size of government. Uh, and in terms of, of opinion, whether it's the, uh, the New York Post or, or any of our papers, we, we are, feel free to express it. Secondly, the, the, there are discussions between myself, and I can only speak for myself, uh, and the editors. I've been an editor in one form or another of four newspapers, and often those discussions are about craft or about issues. You know, I, having had the, the privilege of those positions, sometimes I hear stories that I might happen to pass on to an editor. Uh, and so there, there are, uh, uh, are indeed discussions, uh, and uh, there, sh there should be no doubt about that. But there is also a, a large amount of l local autonomy. But look, the company does have a, a philosophy. Okay. So uh, I, I just want to be clear. So what I'm, I'm quoted here is uh, what I heard Mr Lachlan say. Um, it's simultaneously, we don't turn journalists what to write, but on the other hand, we want to make sure that there's a position, a message that is presented. You know, and that, that's not inconsistent with what you're saying, is it? Do you expect, no, them, you, do you expect there to be a philosophical framework in which the company operates. I think the, the full quote in that quote, if, if my recollection is correct, he said, that's not my role. Uh, and so the, I think there's been a juxtaposition of a, of a couple of senses there. Uh, uh, but the look, there's, there's local autonomy, but at the, at the same time, the company clearly has a philosophy. Yes. And, and my question then, I mean, the third area I might refer to in terms of the change in position in this country, uh, on debt and deficit. The position that's been taken when Labor was in office and the position that's taken when the Conservatives are in office. It does seem that there's some inconsistency, and we discussed the question of consistency before in regard to regulation. I'd be interested to know whether or not is it your view that you are consistent in your coverage, your campaigning approach that you take to news coverage uh, as well. So I, 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 it's difficult for me, as you can imagine, to speak for the Australian issues in the detail you clearly have. Yes. Uh, I, there, is, there is no inconsistency in our principles. Yes. Well, you see, what uh, we, we are also concerned about in terms of the questions that Senator 
Anson Young was putting to you about the change, the, what's been presented as immediate flip uh, in terms of the climate change, is where those policy positions originated. You're presenting to us it's a local initiative, whereas the articles that appeared in the well, a copy I have here before me that appeared in the Age, uh, which is my hometown paper, uh, on the sixth. Uh, on the morning of our inquiry last time round, uh, clearly highlighted that this was a more centralised decision and it was driven by commercial issues. Uh, and it did acknowledge that it was... Um, it did uh, coincide with the global conferences, um, but that 16-page that spread, for instance, was referred to back here. On, on back on the 6th uh, of September. So it wasn't a local initiative being determined uh, in the last few days. It's actually been determined some time ago and, and the way that's presented to us in this country is that it's actually perhaps determined in New York. Would you like to comment on that proposition? Sure. So it's, uh, I read about that initiative on the same day that you did. I think it is also fair to say that uh, the age's coverage of our company is not always accurate and without choice. Any more than so. the Australian's coverage of the age, perhaps? Or the Australian's coverage of the ABC. But the, the fact is that it was indeed uh, generated by uh, the local editors, and, and, and proof of that is, is indeed that here in New York, the first we heard about it was that article, uh, somewhat flawed it may have been. Mm. So it's just that your news editors all come to the same position independently at exactly the same time and say exactly the same thing independently after 10 years of campaigning in exactly the opposite direction. Is that the proposition you're putting to this committee? Senator, first of all, I wouldn't agree with the characterisation of the question. Secondly, it, it's there was a meeting of the local editors, and those editors obviously had ongoing discussions, uh, of which I was not aware. Uh, and was there a collective nature to that decision? Certainly. But you would also like to think that there were distinctive local characteristics in their coverage. Um, could I just follow up, please, Senator Carr? Um, Mr Thompson, it's been put to this committee that uh, Rupert Murdoch uh, likes to pick winners when it comes to Australian elections. Um, and we've seen uh, you know, election after election, there's been uh, the editorialisation of uh, backing um, uh, the, the preferred uh, party for government. Uh, we've seen uh, campaigns uh, that have uh, kind of demonised one side's uh, election uh, policies and proposals versus another. Uh, climate change, obviously, one. Uh, Senator Carr's mentioned the issue of debt and deficit. Um, I just want to understand how we, how somebody, it's been put to us that he likes to pick winners. I'm wondering how does that, is that part of the clear philosophy uh, at News Corporation? You've, you said the, the company clearly has a philosophy. Does that include uh, being able to determine and back uh, the winner when it comes to elections? Uh, Senator, the, the philosophy is around ideas. I, I mean, I have to say there is uh, there's, uh, Murdoch uh, and the real Rupert, and there's quite a distinction uh, between the two. Uh, all societies seem to need their myths, the Greeks, the Japanese. Uh, and uh, the idea, the proposition you, you put, is, uh, is not accurate. Mm. It's been put to us many times that uh, this. So where does it come from? Why why, why would um, uh, why would those who have um, studied and, and observed um, uh, the influence of the Murdoch press and the behaviour of uh, Mr Murdoch in particular why would they put this to a Senate inquiry if there wasn't any truth to it? Where does it come from? Well, people are entitled to their opinions, uh, which, which is a good thing. And there's, there's obviously a diversity of opinion in Australia about the media. Mm. Um, 
Mr Murdoch likes to um, have political candidates um, um, come and visit him when they, uh, at when they attend events in New York? Uh, no, that's uh, that's not a requirement of US visa. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, it was reported that you met with the Prime Minister Scott Morrison uh, in New York when he was there in September. Is that correct? That's correct. And that was after the story in relation to the 16-page uh, uh, spread would be on climate would be published. That that's was, That was known by then. Uh, it was had been published prior to the Prime Minister's visit. Mm -hmm. Was this topic discussed in the um, meeting with uh, Mr Morrison? Well, there were many top Obviously, it was a, a, a essentially a private meeting, so the details uh, I'm, I'm really not totally at liberty to reveal, but I can talk to you about the subjects that, that we discussed. Uh, briefly, uh, at Glasgow, in general terms, not uh, our coverage. Uh, we talked about Afghanistan. Uh, we talked about France and the contretemps with France. We, we are own a small stake in a French newspaper. Uh, we talked about China. Uh, uh, the Prime Minister and I don't necessarily agree on China. Uh, we talked at some length about Japan uh, because we were between Prime Ministers then. Mm -hmm. Prime Minister Suga had resigned um, and was uh, ahead of the appointment of uh, Prime Minister Kishida. Uh, the, obviously, the contours of the Biden administration. Uh, I think you have to remember that he came to uh, New York for UN Week. So this was Australia outbound, not Australia inbound. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked about uh, Kyriakos Mitsotakis, the Greek Prime Minister, who uh, the Australian Prime Minister was going to meet and who I know uh, mm. somewhat. What was the purpose of the uh, meeting? Was it a meeting or was it dinner? It was drinks. It was drinks. After dinner drinks. Okay. Um, and what was the purpose of it? Well, I, I, I was asked, would uh, I have a conversation with the Prime Minister and his delegation uh, ahead of UN Week? Uh, and the understanding I had it was that it would be to talk about international issues. Given I, I haven't been in Australia since as a resident since 1985, I do know quite a few of the other leaders who are attending, and I, I presumed that the Prime Minister was... I presume, first of all, that Prime Minister talks to a lot of people, and I had presumed that he wanted some insight about some foreign policy matters. Mm. And did, uh, did Mr Morrison meet with Mr Murdoch at all during his time in New York? No, he did not. No. Um, was the uh, election a, a topic of discussion at all, the, the pending uh, election back here in Australia? No. And was uh, Mr Morrison's um, uh, pivot on net zero by 2050, was that uh, raised or discussed in this meeting? No, not in, in general terms, there was a, a brief discussion of Glasgow. Did, the, the, Prime Minister, did, did the Prime Minister tell you he was going to be going to Glasgow? No. It, it was the, one of the... Shortest part of the of a fairly long conversation. As I say, it was mostly focused on international affairs, mm -hmm. international leaders, some of whom I, mm -hmm. I know. Mm -hmm. um, what was um, your view, Mr. Thompson, of the uh, Australian uh, news corporations' uh, press during the Black Summer bushfires uh, and the promotion? that uh, and the, of the misinformation that it was arson that caused the, the bushfires? Well, Senator, I, I, if I remember correctly, there were almost three and a half thousand stories published at that time. Uh, I think a very small number of them uh, referenced arsonists. I, the, the context, you would have to look at the context. As, as you know, a small number of those fires were lit by arsonists. But the issue is really, frankly, not uh, the climate change issue. It's not as much how the fire started, but the spread of fire and Did the you... conditions that are conducive to the spread of fire. Were you concerned that uh, the misinformation and the downplaying and denial of climate change was being 
uh, promoted in your newspapers here while the country was burning? Uh, I wasn't directly involved in the coverage, but I do know that our teams discussed it at great length uh, uh, because they take their social role very, very seriously. Has there been any admission that that was a mistake? Well, uh, look, the, the, we had hundreds and hundreds of journalists who were doing their very best to provide coverage to all Australia. At a, a very stressful time for some of them, they were taking personal risk. Uh, I was proud of their coverage. I'm proud of those journalists. Uh, do journalists sometimes make mistakes? No doubt. Um, was it a, has it been a mistake of uh, News Corp to um, promote climate action as being uh, uh, economically reckless for the last decade? Senator, I, I wouldn't uh, agree with your characterisation of the question. Mm. Um, you, front page front pages of newspapers here in Australia for uh, many years have uh, decried any type of a carbon price, uh, climate action being a wrecking ball through the economy, uh, you know, 60, 600 billion dollars uh, kind of cost to the economy. I mean, how, do, how does that? How do we measure uh, that against uh, the um, newfound? Uh, road to Damascus? Well, I would disagree that there's been a Damascene conversion. There's a consistency uh, back to what Rupert Murdoch said in 2006. There's also been a change in technology. The developments of different power sources, different storage sources uh, have, has been quite pronounced so the economic cost, the economic equation is, is obviously changing. And so the, uh, the idealism, absolutely laudable, but only realism will make a meaningful change. And, and so what will our fuel sources be? Nuclear, hydrogen, bigger, better batteries, how renewable? And frankly, not just for us, uh, China, India. I and mean, one of my early reporting missions in, in China was to visit their first nuclear plant in, in Dia Bay. Nuclear, I think, is going to be an issue. But China now has about 47 nuclear plants, about 5% of their total uh, power generation capacity. Mm -hmm. These are the sort of issues that our societies would grapple with. Um, Senator Carr's got a question. So, so is, do I be clear about this, and you can argue the toss about the value of nuclear, but do, are you in fact saying that the point of the change to use approach here is that you want to see this country adopt nuclear power as a policy, as the policy option? Absolutely not, Senator. It's, it's a, a matter that's going to be debated in a lot. It's not just. I just, I just noticed that it's coming up again and again, and you, and you're emphasising it here in your answers today. Is that in fact the point of the change that we, this country, should go nuclear? Senator, no, it's not. Um, Mr. Thompson. Uh, has News Corp in Australia had it wrong all this time on climate? I mean, we've had front pages calling uh, climate action a horror show, the carbon zombies, carbon collapse. There was a celebration when the uh, price on carbon uh, legislation was um, repealed uh, here in the parliament across your newspapers. Um, were you wrong? So the, 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 your characterisation of the coverage, I would disagree with. What, what I've tried to explain is there's clearly been an, a, an evolution. And, uh, Glasgow is important. It's a moment to stop, think, contemplate policy, particularly in the context of technological change and particularly with, with the third deal climate change. Mm -hmm. um, has uh Lachlan Murdoch or Rupert Murdoch changed their opinion on climate change recently? Senator, if, if any questions that you have for Rupert or Lachlan, you have obviously you, should ask them. Have you had... Well, to be fair, Mr Thompson, we asked uh, Mr Murdoch to appear in front of this committee and they, decided, they suggested we get you instead. 
So, well, um, so you're, you're, you're obviously being put up as their mouthpiece. So whether you, whether you realise that or not, that's that's what they've proposed to us. So, um, so, so, so if I could just make one point about that. I'm the chief executive of a news corporation. Hmm. I am absolutely the appropriate person for you to talk to. Uh, I'm the person most responsible globally day to day for business. Lachlan is responsible for, for the Fox Corporation. Uh, Rupert is the chairman. He has oversight with our board of affairs. I, it is absolutely right and important to me and I take responsibility. Mm -hmm. So have they discussed with you um, a, a change in prioritisation in relation to their views on climate change? Not at any length. I mean, we have general discussions, but not at, at any length at all. What is Rupert's view on the 16-page uh, uh, coordinated spread of newspapers here in Australia in relation to climate change? Look, look I, you would have to speak to Rupert to ask him a question about his view. Mm. Has he this discussed this with you at all, Mr Thompson? Uh, look, uh, one thing I would say is I doubt he has seen the 16 pages, So, uh, uh, but as for the broader issues, the uh, broader thoughts, you mm -hmm. uh, obviously it's business. Mm -hmm. um, is, uh, Mr Thompson, is anybody from uh, News uh, Corporation uh, going to be attending uh, the, uh, the World Summit in Glasgow? And as, aside from uh, your journalists that would be uh, accompanying the, the leaders, for example, I'm talking about the, the corporation itself. If, uh, g given COVID and travel and whatnot, if someone's attending, it's most likely to be one of our European executives at this stage, I don't know. But okay. you right to say, we will have dozens and dozens and dozens of journalists there. Yes, OK. Um, Can we have a question? Uh, yes, um, yes, Senator Carr. I'm just interested. So is, is Lachlan, does he remain a co-executive a co chairman of news? He's the co-chairman, no, Senator. Yes, so it's not just for Fox. He's a co-executive chairman. That's correct, isn't it? So, exactly. He's the, the chief executive. He oversees day-to-day -day Fox and he provides overall leadership to news. Yes, I just wanted to be not clear to about his formal standing within the company. That was all. I, I thought you... I didn't quite follow your answer before. Uh, he, he is co, but he is definitely co-executive chairman of News Corp. He's co-chairman. Co-chairman. Thank you. Um, Senator Carr, do you have any other burning no, questions? Thank you very much. Okay. Um, Mr. Thompson, thank you for giving us your time. As I said at the beginning, I understand it's um, in the evening uh, there in yeah, New York, much. and we appreciate uh, your commitment to the process. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator, and thank you to the committee. Thank you. And we've got our uh, next witness uh, on the line. Representatives uh, from the Australian Press Council, can we... Um... OK. Uh, Australian Press Council, uh, can, just wanting to make sure you can hear us, if you can give us a nod or some indication. Yes. OK, wonderful. Thank you. I understand that information on parliamentary privilege and the protection of witnesses and evidence has been provided to you. For the Hansard record, could you please state your full names of the capacities in which you appear today? Uh, Yvette Lamont, I'm the CEO of the Australian Press Council. Uh, Neville Stevens, I'm the chair of the Press Council. Wonderful. Thank you both. For the... Um, I would invite you to give us a short opening statement, if you do have one, and uh, we appreciate you being able to make time for us today, uh, given um, uh, the role of the Press Council in uh, a lot of the discussions we've been having as a committee over the last uh, number of months has been extensive, so it's a good opportunity for, for, um, for you to tell us um, uh, and give us some evidence in relation to, to your role. Uh, so over to you, and then we'll go to some questions. OK, um, well, thank you for the invitation to attend today. The, um, the Press Council has made a submission to this inquiry, and I, I won't repeat its content now. Rather, I'd like 
some more general observations based in the Ms Lambert, could I just ask, is there any way you could bring the microphone closer to you? It's just, it's reverbing a little bit. I don't know that you can. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> That's all right. We might. We might. Um, we'll just have a. We'll, we'll just have a quick pause for a moment. Miss Lambert. It's okay. So um, I'd like to make some general observations based in part on issues raised in earlier hearings of this inquiry. It's, uh, it's, it's essential in a democracy that the press is free to make a to the Australian people a wide diversity of, view, of views and opinions, to hold government, business and community leaders accountable, to protect the public's right to know and to be a trusted source of news in a world of competing sources of information and in some cases, information. Meeting this objective requires high standards of editorial and journalistic practices. More than ever, people need to be able to access reliable and accurate news, news that is relevant to them, whether they live in the city, in rural or regional areas. Publisher members of the Press Council commit to be bound by high standards and to an independent complaints handling system. At this critical junction, there's a heightened need for independent self-regulation of the media, as consumers of news need to be assured that complaints about breaches are assessed independently of government and publishers. The Press Council meets this need and will continue to do so by evolving, exploring partnerships and embracing opportunities and challenges. The Press Council has a diversity of publisher members, around 30. Publisher members include community, rural and Indigenous publishers, a number of online uh, publications, as well as the very large publishing groups. Under this self-regulatory system, the costs of the Press Council are met by publisher members. There are, however, strong safeguards embedded in the Press Council's constitution to enhance the financial security of the Press Council and ensure its independence from all constituent publisher members, whether large or small. These include the fact that a constituent member has to give four years' notice of resignation from the Press Council and is required to meet its financial obligations to the Press Council for three years following its notice of resignation. This change, which was introduced in 2012, ensures that a large publisher cannot threaten the Press Council by immediate cessation of funding. The Constitution requires a majority of Press Council members to be independent of publisher members Public members are drawn from varying walks of life and have not had previous connections or any recent and significant connections with the media. In addition, the Press Council has independent journalist members who have no current links with publishers. Critically, publisher members do not sit on adjudication panels. The Press Council's adjudication panels are tasked to decide whether there has been a breach of the Council's standards of practice. They typically comprise five members drawn from public members and independent journalists. By drawing on a range of independent community members and journalists, adjudication by a level of diversity and experience not always achieved by other bodies or models that are similarly tasked to consider breaches of standards. The Press Council sets binding standards of practice that are contained in its general principles a statement of privacy principles and two specific standards governing the coverage of suicide and contacting patients in hospitals. The Press Council also develops advisory guidelines on a range of important issues following community and stakeholder consultation. The Press Council accepts complaints from primary complainants where they consider they have been personally affected by a possible breach of standards and from secondary complainants, while who not directly affected are able to raise concerns that the articles may have breached. In the case of primary complainants, press council staff are able in many cases to negotiate a suitable remedy with the publication that meets the concerns of complainants. For example, this may be a correction in the publication, a right of reply or an apology by the publication. 
In this way, a complainant has access to a free, independent and impartial service to address their concerns, and this can be a far better alternative than costly litigation. While the Press Council does not have power to levy financial penalties, its adjudications must be published by publications in a prominent position within their publications, and adverse findings are not enjoyed by either journalists or the publication. The value of a published adjudication that upholds or partially upholds a complaint cannot be overstated from a complainant's perspective. A combination of published adjudications and comprehensive standards of practice and advisory guidelines drive higher journalistic standards. While the Press Council plays an integral part in maintaining high journalistic standards and public confidence in the media, there are areas where it could do better. The complaints handling system, while robust, is too slow for the modern world. One of my priorities as the new CEO is to make it faster. The Press Council is committed to further increasing the diversity of its council and adjudication panel membership. It is currently in the process of a recruitment drive for public and independent journalist members. And this factor, as well as others, is very much in mind. Most importantly, there is a need for all stakeholders, including the Press Council, to address emerging issues in the media environment. These include dealing with convergence, where similar content on different platforms can be subject to different regulatory regimes, and the emergence of digital platforms, which have disrupted the traditional revenue model of publishers and which disseminate stories through their own channels that are not part of any established regulatory system. The Press Council looks forward to continuing to engage with existing and emerging stakeholders and to contribute to the discourse on media diversity in a cross-platform media environment. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Senator Carr? Yes, I would. Thank you. I've got a few questions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you very much for your appearance today. And I was uh, perhaps begin by a, perhaps a broad question, and you could assist the committee if you could tell us that um, your submission notes that the convergence of media platforms is a, is a highly significant development. Um, but, and given that, what's the justification for continuing to have a separate voluntary regulator for print media? So if I can respond to that, I think there have been uh, a number of inquiries in this area, as you're aware, and indeed I think the convergence uh, review going back uh, almost a decade now did in fact recommend a body bringing together the print media and uh, broadcast media. I think the important part about the model we have, though, is its independence from government. There's always been a a very strong concern that the media must be free and accountable uh, to hold governments and others accountable, and that having government regulation of that media is not what a lot of the stakeholders are looking for. Well, I'll go to that in a moment, but uh, I just wanted to be clear why we need an in a you know, separate print model, given that so much of the media issues are dealt with through other platforms? Well, I think that's a, a very, very fair question which does need further consideration. And indeed, the Press Council has indicated that it, it sees this as an emerging issue and what they hold about it. Uh, so, I mean, Mr Stevens, you've had extensive experience in government. Uh, the regulatory environment at the moment, in fact, has been argued as uh, not being fit for purpose. The question of your body being uh, as a complaints mechanism for just one small section of it is only one part of that problem, surely. Would you acknowledge that there is, in fact, a, a broader regulatory problem insofar as ACMA is concerned? Uh, it's not really our role to comment on ACMA's effectiveness or otherwise, Senator, but as I said earlier, I believe we do need to look at what the current media environment looks like, and it is very different to first it was the environment when the Press Council was first set up. And uh, absolutely, we all have an obligation to look at how can we, in fact, have something which is fit for purpose 
but which still maintains the safeguards that I referred to earlier. Okay. So let me just, I'll, I'll come back to a number of matters in terms of your funding and structure and those types of issues. How many complaints have you received in recent times about the way in which the council itself operates? You mean directly to the council from members of the public? Yes. Oh no! Well, any for any uh, from any source, Mr. Stearns, well, any source at all. Okay, there's always media scrutiny of the press council and other regulatory bodies, some of which is uh, not necessarily, or some which is critical of, of the council in a number of ways. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have a record of you know individual complaints about the council, but certainly uh, there's a view, of, a wide view of um, the community mm -hmm. about. Some people think it's doing a great job. Others would prefer to do, do things better. Mm. And then there's um, how many complaints do you receive for, about uh, particular masses? Uh, do you have a, any breakdown of that data? Um, I've got some breakdown here, Senator, but to some extent I have to take that on notice for every masthead because we cover about... I think three to four hundred masters. Yeah, okay. So, do you have so, it in so um, in terms of the media companies? Do you have that advice readily handed? I, I appreciate if you can take something on notice on the yeah, masters. I would happy to do that. Thank you. Yeah, I will take that on notice and get back to you on that one. Yes, I do have. Um, not surprisingly, perhaps I can tell you the percentage of complaints in the year 2020-21, yeah. which were received uh, about News Corp. Um, and in that year, we had about 800 complaints overall, of which about 540 concerned publication of mastheads under the News Corp banner. I see. All right. And how many of those complaints did you uh, uphold? Well, uh, when, when we receive a complaint, only a very small number of complaints actually go through to adjudication, mm. which is what is the public. A process where the adjudication decision is actually made public and is um, available to everyone and indeed has to be carried by the publication concerned. In many cases, public, in many cases complaints um, are not uh, considered a likely breach of standards, in which case the Secretariat will um, not take it further forward. In other cases, there may be these which are negotiated with a particular publication. So if I can come to the last financial year, 2021, 14, there were 14 adjudications. Yes, thank you. So of the 540 that you found involved News Corps, how many adjudications were there? Of uh, the News Corp, we had 11 adjudications. Uh -huh. And what was the nature of the adjudications for those News Corps? Did you f find in favour of the of News Corp or against the...? Uh, some were upheld and some were not upheld, Senator. Okay. But, so how uh, many were upheld? I'm just having a look at those figures now. Um, Number of complaints I feel eighty percent were upheld on my figures. News calls. So, so of the eleven, of so, those which were adjudicated, yes. Um, so eight out. Is it, so are you saying was it nine out of the eleven were upheld? Is that what you're saying? Sorry, what I'm saying, what I'm saying is um, six out of the eleven were upheld. Fifty-five percent. Fifty-five percent. Okay. I'm just wondering whether my maths has gone astray, but that's... No, that's, not at all. It's my error. My okay. error. I don't. Fifty-five percent were upheld. So let's get this straight. 540 complaints, you ended up finding that there were six upheld. That's suppose that went to adjudication, yeah. Senator. And, and yes. so what happened to the other uh, 534? Well, as I say, in many cases, they are discontinued at an early stage because the Secretariat does not consider them a likely breach oh, yes, of the standard. Yes. 
Yes, they were discontinued in some form, but it, it's, it's some form. Yeah. So 534 were discontinued in some form. They didn't go anywhere. That's correct. Yeah. So, so I'm sorry, Senator. Can you, the number you mentioned was what? I'm sorry. So there were 500. As I understood your evidence, Mr. Stevens, 540 complaints were received in 2021 correct. involving News Corp publications, yep. Yep. of which you ended up adjudicating on 11 and which six you found were upheld. Now, as I read that, that means 534 were either discontinued or found in favour of the company in the case of the... Uh... No, that's, that's, not, that's not correct. There are right. some cases... Let me... In some cases, the remedy was negotiated, which was satisfactory to, to the parties. Mm -hmm. And of those... Uh, Numbers, my figures show about 59 of those complaints were actually resolved through a remedy. 59 by remedy. And what does that mean? Yeah. Well, it can mean a number of things. It may, it may be a correction. It may be an apology. It, it may be a, a, right, a reply. right of reply. It, 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 there's a number of issues. That could, could, okay. It's a resolution of a matter which, don't, which yeah. does not involve yeah. Yeah. Well, if you can give me any further details on that, I'd appreciate it. Well, so we, we can. We can we, take that on that. Uh, you see, and you're going to give me a breakdown on the complaints that involve your procedures. As on, you're taking that on notice, haven't you? Yes, we have. Okay. See, we've had a submission here, number 46, from the United Firefighters Union, yes. which set out its dissatisfaction in the way in which it's been treated by uh, the Herald Sun in Melbourne. Correct. And it detailed that over the course of a dis dispute, industrial dispute, there were 84 press reports, um, and if I remember rightly, something like 54 front pages, uh, yeah. hi highly uh, critical, which the union puts to, uh, uh, in fact, highly biased, highly prejudicial, in fact, led to suicides. But when they put these complaints to you, the complaint that is to the press council, uh, the council advised that you can only deal with small um, number of them. Is that the case? Is that your understanding of the one, the that evidence that I've presented, that and two? My, that is my. Sorry. Is that what? And was that? Is that an accurate reflection of your response? That is my understanding of what the situation was at that time, Senator. Yeah. I do not accept that we cannot now deal with a volume of uh, articles, and indeed we've had two recent adjudications which have, in, have referred to uh, a, a number of articles over a period. I okay. refer to adjudications. So it was, just the, it was just the firefighters that you had a problem with? Or was it just a period of time? I can't, I, can't, I can't give you any more detail on that, Senator, because... I, I was not there and neither was our CEO. I can only say that our current procedures do enable us to cope with a volume of complaints. I see. Well, how do we, at the time, is the, the submission that has been put to us correct? Was it an re accurate reflection of the way in which the press council responded to the United Firefighters at the time? My understanding at the time was that they did say that they could not handle all the articles, but asked the firefighters union to identify a number of art, a smaller number of articles, which could be processed for the complaint system. So, in fact, you were telling the complainant that the council could only deal with small evils, but not great ones. As I say, that may have been what was said there. It's not no longer the case. Yes, at the time. Yes, uh, and since when has that been the case? I can't tell you when it changed because I wasn't about, I wasn't around at the time of the firefighters union. I can only say that in the most recent times where I have been present, we have in fact taken a number of cases and complaints involving a number of articles. You've, uh, have you had a chance to look at the file that the uh, union actually put to you? Who were at the? I haven't, no, Senator. No. I, 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 I appreciate I, you weren't the there at the time, but. In my experience with this uh, union, they present, and they certainly in terms of their submissions to this in, uh, 
inquiry, extraordinarily well documented material. Uh, and I'm just. Uh, Several it, binders. Yes, I mean, <laughs> as if they're presenting to, to a court. I mean, they take their, their presentations extremely seriously. I would urge you to have another look at that, given the way in which it's presented, because it does appear in the case that this occurred that the council came across as an entirely toothless tiger. Are you now saying that's changed? I'm saying that we, have, we are certainly now taking complaints against a series of articles, and uh, I've mentioned a couple of examples recently went to adjudication. I see. Um, see the the all right because um, the problem is that many organisations such as the uh, firefighters also put to us that they weren't able to exercise their le any legal uh, defence through libel action because of the way in which the libel laws actually work uh, and that they had no avenue to argue their, their case other than this Senate inquiry I think was the way it was been put that was the only opportunity they've had to put a counter view. Uh, uh, they were highly critical of your procedure. Have many other submissions been put to you along those lines about how ineffective the press council actually is? I think we've actually dealt with the effectiveness before, Senator. Yes, a number of um, people have actually expressed a view that uh, we lack monetary sanctions. I think yes. we've addressed that. So Professor Rickardson, for instance, who represented the MEAA on the Press Council, um, has indicated that the Australian has effectively a veto power over part of your adjudications affecting that newspaper. Is that the case? I don't know. It's not the case. Why not? The situation. What I'm do you sorry, think? What, what's, what's your, what, what, do you, what do you base that view on? I base it for you on looking at the history of the Matthew Rickardson situation where the Australian first raised objections to him sitting on adjudication panels involving the Australian. That was first raised um, before I became chair, but the council did not make a decision on it. Uh, it has been raised more recently with me by Professor Rickardson himself, and I'm seeking independent legal advice as to whether the Australian's concerns are valid or not and that will be considered by council at its next meeting. So we are, we'll be addressing that issue directly. At the next meeting? Yes, our next council, next council meeting. When will that be? It's a matter of uh, before Christmas. I see. Um, Senator Khan, do you know Senator Bragg has some questions? Yes, yeah, sure, I'll be, look. Um, the proposition that uh, Mr, um, and uh, Professor, Rickinson will be appearing here today, so we'll be able to ask him directly. But the propositions that were advanced in the Fickleston report for future reform in this area have been advanced to us in a number of submissions. What do you say uh, about that? Uh, do you think that's an appropriate uh, course of action in terms of reform of complaints mechanisms for media reporting in this country? That's a very broad question. Yes, Senator and that's why you have a chance to answer it. Right, I'm trying to answer it in the best way I can, but at the same time there were a number of competing reports. The convergence report produced a different model to cope with convergence to the Finkelstein model, and my understanding is the Finkelstein model involving government regulation of the media was not seen as acceptable but the regulation through the parliament, not the government, through the parliament, exists in a whole range of areas of the media, doesn't it? it does. Isn't that what correct? Indeed, I think that's one of the challenges of convergence is because some areas of the media, such as broadcasters, are in fact under the auspices, if you like, of ACMA. Others, the more traditional print media, are not. Uh, in a, in a different self-regulatory environment. And one of our challenges is trying to bring two different environments together. And Mr. Stevens, that's the point of the question I asked you earlier as to whether or not it's time to have a look at that. Mm. Uh, and I said, I think we, we have accepted we need, need to look at convergence. And the Press Council mm. is very happy to work with all stakeholders about what is the best model to tackle. We've, 
look, my final question is this. We've had a petition, the largest petition, uh, electronic petition the uh, Parliament's received calling for a Royal Commission, or perhaps a judicial inquiry, as others would say, into these broader areas. What would your response to such a proposition be? I don't believe a Royal Commission is required in this area. I, I think there's been a large number of inquiries in this area. If I can perhaps reflect somewhat of my government experience over the years, Senator, I think governments are very good at inquiries. What they sometimes need to do is to get out and make some decisions and to put forward a way forward rather than have yet another inquiry. Thank you very much, Mr Simpson. Uh, thank you, Senator Carr, and I'll give the call to Senator Bragg. Thanks, Chair. Uh, Good morning. I just have uh, two lines of inquiry. Um, the first is in relation to the extensive uh, debate uh, that's been conducted um, around the use of the digital platforms and small uh, and diverse pub publishers. As we heard this morning, uh, large organisations like News Limited have been able to come to an accommodation with the uh, tech platforms. Uh, but you would be aware that many of your members have not been able to get uh, deals done, um, and many of them have frankly found it unbearable uh, trying to deal with Facebook in particular, I think, which has been um, and continues to be a very hard company to do, to, to engage with. Um, what have you done to support your members, if anything, in this particular engagement? Well, let, let me start by saying, yes, we are aware of those issues and I uh, certainly think that um, there are very, very significant issues in regards to viability of some particular digital uh, publications. And indeed, we have advocated on their behalf in a range of ways. Uh, for example, I think the government programs and assistance, the uh, media, the public interest news gathering initiatives are something that we have uh, supported and welcomed, and I think that is an important part of trying to maintain that viability. Uh, we've also made submissions to the ACC in regard to the media bargaining. Um, so, what are you doing now? At the moment, well, at the moment we we are. As I said, we are, we are talking with country president, which is one of our larger members, right. and uh, we, we are talking to Facebook and, and to Google, but to be frank, they are a big organisation and we are not necessarily their number one uh, stakeholder. Sorry, can I just, can we clarify that, um, Senator Bragg? So the Australian Press Council is in talks with Facebook in relation to, to, to their behaviour and approach to smaller publishers? What I said was we are talking to Facebook and Google about the general issues in regard to online media. Um, so that's only one aspect of it. Clearly, um, at the end of the day, there are many issues that arise from Facebook and the other platforms that we are trying to engage with. How have you, how have you found... There's someone behind you, by the way, um, just so you know. Um, you, well, maybe it's OK. Um, how have you found dealing with them? Very hard to get decisions out all the times. Yeah, but, but so you are engaged with. Well, we are engaged to a point. We've we've had we've had discussions with them about uh, the role the press council might play in, in their environment, but nothing has emerged from it in a concrete sense. Okay, nothing's emerged in a concrete concrete sense. Okay, okay. Um, well, I encourage you to keep pursuing that. That's important. Yeah. The, the other issue I wanted to ask you about, just um, so you've got about, is it right to say you have 900 members? Uh, we, we have about 30 uh, oh. constituent publishers. A large number of them have many milestones. So oh, I see, that's right, yeah. yeah so, so you have 30. So right, so you have 30 members, do you? Uh, 30, about 30, yeah. OK. And um, I'll be brief, because I'm sure you've covered this in, the, in past um, discussions with this committee, but um, is one of the criteria for membership um, editorial independence?
Look, the publications have to abide by our standards of practice, which is not quite what you're saying about editorial independence. The important point is that they must abide by our standards. Okay. Because I've got here your general principles, which say that conflicts of interest are avoided or adequately disclosed and that they do not influence published material. So I imagine that a conflict of interest could be um, a conflict of interest that comes from a, an owner of one of the members of the press council, right? Um, there are many examples, but that was certainly possibly one of them, yes. Okay, so I did, and, and what's your position on allowing uh, media outlets that are owned by lobbyists into your um, industry body? I'm not sure what, what, how you define a lobbyist, Senator. Um, so I don't understand the question really. Okay, well, I guess I, I'm, I'm wondering about this organisation called The New Daily. Yes, yes. Is that, is that a member of yours? Yes, it is. Okay, and are you aware that it's owned by uh, a lobbyist organisation? I'm aware, but it's um, involved with the Australian Super. Is, is that the organisation you're referring to? Yeah. So, do you think that's an appropriate uh, member for the press council to, ha to have? Well, when you doubt he was admitted to the press council in 2012. At that time, the ownership or the involvement of Australian Super was um, revealed to the council. The council at that stage made the decision to admit me daily. Okay. So um, if I resign from Parliament soon, um, which I'm not proposing to do, don't worry, um, <laughs> um, and I set up a uh, tobacco or a firearms um, organisation, which established a subsidiary company which was going to be a, a newspaper or an online pub publication, I could, I could join the press council. Not necessarily, because we, um, we, we do look at every application to join and we have refused some applications in the past where we don't believe that they are appropriate as members of the council. Okay. Could, could I ask you to give us on notice the publications that you've refused entry to? I can certainly have a look at that, Senator. Um, I'd be happy to have a look at it. Thank see you. See if there's something. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Sorry, Senator oh, Brown. Um, okay. Well, so what is the status of this? I mean, this seems to be um, an outlier mem member that you have, uh, one that is owned by a particular vested interest. Um, I'm just wondering, what is the status of that? Is that under review or is that a... Is that a... A member that you're happy to have, or what? The new Daly is currently a member, and it's not under review, no. Okay, so um, what steps are you taking to manage this unique member you have and their conflicts? It would depend very much on, on the uh, situation referring to. For example, if there was an article about superannuation, then we would expect the article to refer to the ownership of the new Daly. Okay, so um, is there anything else you're proposing to do to manage this? Okay, let, let me ask you, ask you this way. Do you have any other members that are owned by um, a lobbyist or a similar lobbying organisation? I have to take that. I don't, I don't, on the face, I don't think so, but I have to take that on notice to be sure. Why do you say they're a lobbyist? Because it's owned, it's an it's industry owned, super it's fund. Owned, it's owned by industry super holdings. So, it's a lobbying so organisation. What, unlike News Limited, it, lobby, it lobbies governments all over this country, that's day news, in, day out. That's a newspaper if you want to describe that as a lobbyist, that's a, that's a then they put, it, put the same question. You're very sensitive about these issues, aren't no, you? No, I am not. I just think you should be consistent. Okay, well, I'd be grateful if you could come back on notice on that question, and also if you could take on notice any other steps you're taking to manage this unique member that you have inside your constituency. As I said earlier, we, we would expect any, any articles that refer to the you know, regulation to carry a disclaimer about the ownership. Okay. Well, can you provide that information on notice, please? Certainly. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Senator Bragg. Thank you. Uh
to the Australian Press Council. Um, we, you have taken some notice, uh, some questions on notice, and just to let you know the due date for those will be the 5th of November. Uh, so the Secretariat will be in touch uh, about how to um, get that information to us. Thank you for giving us your time this morning. We appreciate it. Thank you. Very Thank, much. You. Thank you. Now um, we're going to take a uh, suspension um, uh, for. Do we need 10 minutes or are no, we happy to? Not, I think we can do five. Yeah, five we, four, yes, six, I think we might take a five minute break um, and we'll be back here at quarter to 11. Um, and we'll have uh, representatives from Deakin University and the Public Interest Journalism Initiative. Thank you. Professor Matthew Rickardson and Christy Hess from Deakin University, who are representing the Media Innovation and the Civic Future of Australia's Country Press Project. And I also welcome the representatives, including Mr Fells, from the Public Interest Journalism Initiative. Now, we might um, start with Pidgey first. Um, if you could both please give us your full... Y yes, okay. yes, we've got both of them simultaneously. simultaneously. But what we will do first is hear from uh, Pidgey, uh, the Public Interest Journalism Initiative. We can have um, you both give your full names uh, and the capacities in which you appear, uh, and, um, and then we'll have an opening statement from you, and then we'll move to uh, the Deakin University representatives, if that's OK. So we'll start with you, Mr Fells. Um, Professor Alan Fells, Chair of the Public Interest Journalism Initiative, and our CEO, Anna Drafin. Drafin. Anna, we'll just need you to um, introduce yourself. Give us your full name, please. Anna Drafin. Sorry, we'll need you to repeat that. We lost you. Just no. You're, I think you're mute. I think you've muted yourself. <laughs> I'm sorry, Alan. Alan and I are in the same room, so we're trying not to give you reefers. Um, oh, okay. Anna Draffin, Chief Executive Officer, of the Public Interest Journalism Initiative. Okay. All right. Thank you. Well, I, I'm sure. Um, uh, you can work it out amongst yourselves who, who needs to take the question and then we can direct in that way. Um, I must say, it doesn't look like you're in the same room at all. So that's very clever. Um, <laughs> all right. Um, uh, could I uh, ask you to give us an opening statement and then we'll introduce the representatives from uh, Deakin University. Thank you, Senator Ospik, for a couple of minutes and Anna will then add a couple of minutes so the Public Interest Journalism Initiative welcomes the chance to appear before you. Uh, we're an independent think tank focused on the sustainability of public interest journalism. Our work seeks to inform practical policy solutions and public discussion on the importance of pluralistic news media. Since PG's inception in late 2018, there's been more change than anyone thought possible in the news media landscape, not just in Australia, but worldwide. But one thing hasn't changed, the need to find ways to secure the future of news production, and more specifically, the future of public interest journalism across its spectrum of investigative reporting to the nuts and bolts of routine but crucial media coverage uh, of news. Um, if anything, this prerequisite has become more urgent. Following an era of sustained media convergence and digital disruption, the onset of COVID-19 dried up the last vestiges of meaningful advertising revenue for news media and resulted in dramatic market changes 
over the past 18 months. News is an essential component of any working democracy. It's also a piece of critical emergency infrastructure as seen in recent bushfires and floods. It assists community resilience and cohesion, particularly in rural and regional areas. However, the cost of producing public interest journalism is high. And as financial returns on this public good diminish, so too does the commercial incentive to continue its production. Yet sustainable public interest journalism relies on a thriving, diverse media sector that includes a variety of commercial, public and other operators. So to ensure media diversity in Australia, a mix of fiscal measures is necessary to support transition and to stimulate existing news businesses and to encourage new entrants. The Commonwealth Government recognised news as an essential service through pandemic relief, such as the $55 million public interest news gathering program. Mm -hmm. The legislative passage of the news media bargaining code has set a longer term outlook on the commercial value of news content and has moved digital platforms towards substantial deals with major media players. The context for these deals is a world first and sets an interesting precedent for other jurisdictions as well as for the future of Australian news. But importantly, public policy intervention should support a spectrum of industry players, large and small, retail and wholesale, metro and regional. And to encourage news diversity, support should be tied to quality news production and availability, something that's not always been the case in the Australian context. Now I hand over to Anna. So how has... Alan, you'll need to turn your sound off. I'm not sound off. Yeah. So how has I might change rooms when we get to questions. Yeah, um, so how has news production in Australia changed over the past few years? Fiji has been tracking changes in news production and availability via our Australian newsroom mapping project. Our data shows there has been 232 contractions, that is closures, reductions in service or ends of print editions, and 110 expansions since January 2019. Most of these changes occurred within the last 18 months, of which roughly two thirds were market contractions, and those were disproportionately skewed to regional Australia. Regional contractions were more likely to be closures or decreased services of local titles, while the majority of the metropolitan contractions were end of print editions, echoing the trend that we're seeing towards digital. The eastern states were the most impacted, both in terms of volume and types of change. New South Wales, Queensland and Victoria together account for 87% of all changes were observed over the last two years, while the a, uh, while ACT, Northern Territory and Tasmania account for the remainder. Green shoots have emerged in different hotspots, but a cautionary note, some of these new entrants have already closed the doors after only a short period of training. Mm. So what else can be done to foster media diversity? There are a range of solutions worthy of consideration. Tax mechanisms could offer significant returns and public benefit. Our research shows that an industry rebate scheme could inject $356 million per annum and tie investment directly to public interest journalism outcomes. Such a scheme has recently been adopted by the Canadian government. Philanthropic giving, as per the US example, could also stimulate a domestic not-for-profit news sector. 
A new research released last month shows there is a small but growing funder appetite for the sector. But there are practical and mechanical barriers to be overcome through legislative change and other initiatives. Australia's news blackout on Facebook earlier this year demonstrated to the community the extent to which their everyday lives rely upon news and current affairs, especially during COVID-19 and amid rising dis and misinformation. Public interest journalism is a public good which needs safeguarding now, but there is no silver bullet. Investment is needed from the industry itself, the digital platforms, philanthropy, government, as well as consumer support to ensure future media plurality, that is, a genuine diversity of voice, ownership and community coverage. We welcome your questions and we're happy to share any of our reference notes after the hearing. Thank you. Uh, thank you both. Now I'll just hand over to um, the Deakin University representatives. Um, I understand Mr. Professor Rickardson is on the telephone as opposed to video, which is um, uh, fine. Uh, and uh, Dr. Hess, if you're, we can see you on our screen. So if you could both please give us your full names, the capacity in which you appear today. Uh, Christy Hess, Associate Professor of Communication at Deakin University. Uh, and it's Matthew Rickardson, uh, Professor of Communication at Deakin University. Wonderful. And um, an opportunity to uh, give us a short opening statement and then we'll go to questions. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Hanson Young, and to all senators for the opportunity to appear today. I began my career as a regional journalist and since moving into academia about 15 years ago, I've spent much of my time researching the sector. Uh, it's very clear that Australians value local news, especially a local newspaper. So we've conducted a recent survey of local news audiences as part of an Australian Research Council linkage project and I've forwarded copies for circulation to the committee. Uh, this survey indicates a continued strong demand for the printed product across rural and regional areas. In fact, most participants view it as an essential service. The survey also found that policies affecting the future of local news would influence the way readers vote at the next federal election and that any subsidies allocated to the sector should focus on employing local journalists. It's been well documented that local news services in Australia are facing difficult times and there's no doubt a need for intervention. We're suggesting three key areas for consideration. Firstly, a comprehensive look at the relationship between government advertising spend and its relationship to the viability and diversity of local news. Uh, by government advertising spend, we're not referring simply to political uh, campaign ads, but rather the type of information that's essential to social order, such as public notices, COVID health messaging, and information about local government affairs. What's interesting is this expenditure has increasingly shifted to social media, or you know, tiers of government are opting to control messaging via their own websites and publications at the expense of advertising in independent news outlets. This level of spending is also highly uneven across states and territories. Which leads to our second recommendation and that's of approved improved accountability. Any news outlet that receives any source of government revenue or government mandated revenue, such as uh, what's happening with the news uh, bargaining code, should be independently scrutinised for its effectiveness. When there's government support on the table, news outlets need to be held accountable for producing quality journalism and information that matters to a community with the support of these public funds. And thirdly, uh, it's important to recognise the uh, and support green shoots as an added new startups in the sector, especially in areas where news gaps are being identified. Uh, the PING funding was only available for existing and established media outlets such as ACM, which closed down uh, dozens of printing presses during COVID. 
And when independent startups sought to enter the marketplace, they were being hamstrung by structures that limited access to both subsidies and government advertising revenue, which at an immediate disadvantage. So that's it for me. I'll, I'll pass to Matthew briefly. You're on mute, Mr. Rickardson. Sorry about that. Thank mm -hmm. you, Senator Hanson Young. Um, uh, and thank you to the to the Senate committee for the opportunity to appear before you this morning. Um, so I will I would just like to uh, given that some of the issues that have already been discussed in the previous session were mentioned. I thought I would um, complement uh, what my colleague has said by just talking briefly about the system of co-regulation and self-regulation that exists. Um, as I was a member of the independent inquiry into the media, media regulation, uh, sometimes known as the Finkelstein inquiry uh, that, that uh, ran about a decade ago. Um, at that time, the inquiry found that the the system of regulation was both fragmented and weak. Uh, and the environment in which the news media existed then was already converged, or at the very least converged. Uh, the regulatory system then in place was separate. You had the uh, Australian Press Council looking after primarily print media, uh, the Australian Communications and Media Authority looking after radio and television, and for online media, there wasn't much regulation at all. A decade later, uh, media convergence is a lived reality for both journalists and those who consume journalism, and yet the regulatory framework has changed only marginally. Uh, the Press Council does now regulate the online arms of formerly print media companies, as well as some online-only outlets. Uh, but there are still some on online on sorry online-only outlets that aren't regulated by the Press Council. Uh, the West Australian is one prominent example, and more recently, Guardian Australia is another. And there remains journalistic content available online that is that is not regulated, because the Press Council is a voluntary self-regulator. Uh, for these reasons, among others, the Media Entertainment and Arts Alliance notified the Press Council earlier this year of its intention to withdraw from it. That was what was alluded to in the session earlier, and I'm happy to speak to that issue in more detail. Um, what I would like, just finally like to say for the, for the Senate before I um, uh, hand over to any questions, uh, the Press Council is funded by the news media industry, but because of the highly concentrated nature of media ownership in Australia, it remains vulnerable to being disproportionately influenced by a bigger fund, biggest funder, which is New Corporation Australia. News provides 60% of the Council's funding. And when the media inquiry looked into the Press Council a decade ago, that level was 45%. And the understanding was that no single publisher could contribute more than 50% of the Council's fund. Uh, and yet that is the situation in which the Council finds itself today. And I'm happy to speak further to that or answer any questions. Thank you very much, Senator. Great, thank you so much. Um, and I might go first to <clears throat> Senator Carr, um, and uh, we'll just, uh, you know, if you've got well, specific questions, um, and then if there are, uh, if, if, if any of you want to jump in, then you'll just need to, to wait, identify yourself for Hansard, and then we can get you to chip in. Senator Carr. So, Professor Rickerson, I'd like to take you up on your offer to comment on the issue that you've mentioned in the later part of your remarks. Uh, as to the uh, union's withdrawal from the press council. And in doing so, could you please also comment upon the attacks on yourself? There's a, quite a series sure. of uh, quite vitriolic remarks being made about your role, given your mm -hmm. engagement in the Finkelstein inquiry. And that's, I've understood that that's effectively the connection uh, could you comment, give us the, your advice as to what is the nature of that? Uh, and I'll, sure. I'll, I'll answer that first, and I've got a few more questions that go to the issue of regulation. Okay. Well, well sadly, Senator, I'm not Robinson Crusoe when it comes to being subjected to vitriolic attacks by, by various outlets from News Corporation Australia. There's a long list of people, some of whom have been subjected to significantly more vitriolic attacks than, than I have. Um, that said, 
Uh, I think there is a connection between my role in the Finkelstein inquiry and then my later uh, appointment to the press council, which I, the Media Entertainment and Arts Alliance asked me to be its representative on the council. I was very happy to do that. Uh, and that's, so then I was uh, attacked on the grounds that I was um, uh, a creature of the Finkelstein inquiry, that I was connected with that Stalinist recommendations for media uh, media regulation and so on. Um, the, 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 issue, the issue that I've alluded to earlier is that one news organisation provides more than 50, well over 50% of the funding of the press council, and it's been acknowledged for a long time that that's not a healthy position to be in for anyone, not for the media company, not for the press council, not for people who complain to it. Um, the other issue that you allude, uh, that you mentioned, Senator, was to do with uh, the Australian has made a complaint to the press council uh, back at the either the very end of 2017 or early 2018 that they believe that I had an inherent bias against the newspaper and therefore I should not sit on any adjudication panel hearing complaint about their journalism and I personally believe that was unacceptable that a publisher member of the press council should be trying to dictate to the council who should and shouldn't sit on adjudication panels about com hearing complaints about their journalism. Uh, that was brought to the council, um, as, as uh, Mr Stevens said in his testimony earlier, the matter was not resolved. Uh, I have raised that matter with um, the council and with Mr Stevens on a number of occasions since, and I draw your attention to the fact that it is the best part of three years since this first issue, this issue first came up and it remains unresolved. And yet I think it's a key question uh, for any self-regulatory body that the it should not be being dictated by its members as to who should and should on, shouldn't sit on adjudication panels about their journalism. And the broader question then about the fitness for purpose for the current of the current regulatory regime. You indicated your engagement with the Finkelstein inquiry some 10 years ago and your knowledge, I presume, and perhaps others might want to come in on this question. Um, the Convergence Review is uh, was, uh, was more than 10 years old now. Um, I would ask you yeah, if you could well, comment on that, yeah. whether or not uh, the current regulatory regime is actually fit for purpose. And no, I don't think it is. That uh, would be my view. Um, sorry. Uh, sorry, if we could ask, I'll ask, others might want to comment as well. And in particular, given the petition this committee has received as to whether or not it'd be appropriate for a broader inquiry that has the capacity to actually uh, direct witnesses to appear, the Royal Commission or Judicial Inquiry would be appropriate to allow us to actually, in a forward-looking way, get to a mechanism that actually deals with the broad scope of the current media environment that picks up the issues in terms of online um, platforms, the questions of media diversity, um, the other issues that relate to the uh, censorship and questions of defamation, questions of those broader matters that are now uh, what defines a publisher, those sorts of questions that need attention. Could I ask you all to comment on that, please? Perhaps you could start, Professor. Okay, all right, all right. thank you, Senator. Um, well, I don't think it's fit for purpose. I mean, I, I, one of the recommendations, and this was a decade ago, was that it made no sense then back in 2012 when the inquiry reported to have separate media regulatory bodies for separate parts of the media when the media was already being converged it makes even less sense now. Um, there were some good historical reasons why different regulatory regimes emerged, but those historical reasons by and large have, have disappeared. And, um, and so, yes, I, I think there is a need for a new body uh, that would regulate, um, you know, print as in text, radio, television, online, and indeed, uh, as you alluded to earlier and questioned, Senator, to other witnesses, the uh, the big tech platforms, which are 
which are published and which produce huge amounts of content and uh, and or and or the, the mechanism by which it's distributed. So it's no longer fit for purpose and it does need to be looked at again thoroughly. And the, the point about a, a regular, sorry, a royal commission or a judicial inquiry is that it has greater powers than, than for example, the uh, inquiry that I worked on has. And so that you could get to uh, a, a nub of issues more, more fully and more appropriately. Would anyone else wish to comment on that proposition? Yeah, so with all the um, changes that are going on, it is clear that there needs to be policy analysis and rethink, policy design, policy action uh, that is fairly fundamental. Um, by the way, there are the older reviews that would be quite useful, incidentally, if some of the data there was put up to date. But on the big question, uh, what form that policy set of actions takes, it's, it's really up to the parliament and the government of the day, at least from our point of view. It's also a question of what informs the parliament and what is the best mechanism to ensure that the parliament has accurate information, and that's the point about the nature of any inquiry that actually produces that, that information. Yeah. Yes, I would have thought so. Hmm. Does anyone else have a view on this matter? I think Rickardson has answered that um, appropriately on our behalf. Hmm. The, uh, if I could then go on with some other questions, if that's the case. The, if I could, the Deacon has made this uh, university submission, proposes that there be a, a broader use of government notices as a form of indirect subsidy. Uh, could you expand on that proposition uh, and, and the mechanism by which that, uh, under that proposal, money would be distributed because clearly, if a government is seeking to advise the public of any particular matter, it would want to know that it actually has a particular audience reach. It wants to know that it's actually talking to people that will hear the message. So I would have thought there be some has to be some correlation, uh, some understanding of who they're actually dealing with. So can you give us some advice as to what you mean by the use of government uh, notices as an indirect form of subsidy. Thank you, Senator. Uh, I think the point we're trying to make here is that we need to acknowledge that uh, government advertising revenue has actually been an indirect subsidy for uh, mainstream media for more than 100 years, and that that has increasingly, it's been increasingly taken away. And it's uh, also increasingly creating an unlevel playing field in the sector. Uh, so if we look at, um, I can give you the example of uh, last year we had a startup enterprise uh, in Narra Court, South Australia, that was trying to take on, you know, uh, create some information for the people in that town after the closure of, uh, of an ACM uh, printing press. Uh, it, it couldn't. It, it struggled to get traction because uh, when ACM did resume, it had access to all of the local government advertising revenue, state government advertising revenue, and it was also benefiting from the the round of PING funding. So it put the startups at an immediate disadvantage. So in terms of what that looks like structurally moving forward. Uh, I would suggest it just needs uh, immediate attention. So you've got a proposal here for a regional media advisory council to assist in the distribution of funding as well, if, you, yes. this, if I understood you correctly in your submission? That's correct, yes. How would that operate? And, and how would you ensure that the industry itself would accept that model? Uh, I think that is to be determined, and I will uh, defer to uh, to Professor Rickardson uh, for his input here. Uh, but at the end of the day, there needs to be an independent body that assesses how government subsidies are spent in the sector, 
Um, that is not happening at the moment, and, um, and it is absolutely essential. The only thing I would add, Senator, to what my colleague has, has said is um, it, it does appear that there, well, it, it's hard to find the current mechanism by which those various initiatives are being uh, both evaluated and then made, made transparent to the, to the parliament and the general public. And, uh, and this is a fast moving space, the meat um, environment. And, and so if, if those programs are working, we need to know that they're working. And if they're not working, we need to know the same and therefore act accordingly. And it's, it's, it's hard to find um, accurate, up to date, and comprehensive information about how those various initiatives are working. You, you say that uh, there should be targeted support for startup news ventures. Um, I think you'd all be aware that I've had considerable experience in grants issues relating to startup companies. Uh, in public policy terms, it's often a controversial area. I'm wondering how you would overcome those controversies in terms of startup media companies, particularly in terms of providing public support, public investment in uh, in such ventures. How would that be done? I think the first thing that needs to happen is um, is uh, looking at the the basic uh, mandate of revenues. So at the moment, for ping funding, uh, companies had to have a, an income of one hundred and fifty or revenue of one hundred and fifty thousand. Now, for for someone that wants to set up, uh, we've got to remember that um, that local news is a public good, but it's also a social good. Mm -hmm. So people that are trying to start up these ventures, uh, they see the gap and they see that um, that people in their communities are crying out for reliable uh, information. And, and that's where the attention needs to be when we think about supporting green shoots, you know, not necessarily in terms of their commercial um, uh, application, but their social good. Doctor, I... I... I don't think there'd be any argument, certainly with many of us on this committee, that there's, there's public interest journalism and public good support. But my question goes to how do you actually develop a funding mechanism to support that that doesn't lead you into massive political problems? Right. There's Thank another, you. If, so I... if, there, if, if there's another... Uh, if, if, Ms. Draffin, you wanted to say something, by all means, come in. But can you if let's I hear from you first? Let's hear from Dr. Hess if she wants to answer that direct question I put to her first. Did you want? Did you want to respond, think, Dr. Hess? Yeah, I think that um, that in terms of supporting startups, the assessment and evaluation mechanisms need to be put in place first. But this doesn't require substantial capital. You know, in order to support a startup. In you know very small amounts of of um, of public uh, funds, so um, I would just suggest that there needs to be the structure in place to assess, evaluate, and distribute this funding for right. foremost. I just say to you, as a former minister for innovation, I can tell you that sounds great, but it's nowhere near how the world works. Right? In, you know, it's extremely difficult. Um, and I'm very extensive. That's where you have quantifiable indicators, not uh, such uh, subjective judgments as what makes good public interest journalism, particularly in regional areas. I mean, I, that, that's what, what troubles me about the proposal. I just wanted to know how you would get those, any indicators that could be defend, defended on the floor of the parliament. I'll leave that To be you. determined, Senator. Yeah, I think so, I think so. <laughs> Uh, sorry, is it... Uh, Graffin, you wanted to add to that? Yes. If I may, Senator, thank you. PG is supportive of investigations around a notion of a central public interest fund. Um, and Christie's put up one version that's regionally specific. And we did do some preliminary investigations off the back of the... Um, media reform green paper where it was looking at potential for auctioning off a spectrum and a one-off injection of funds um, and one of the options we had put up 
for exploration was the notion of a central fund. Um, to your point, Senator, how that is then administered, et cetera, um, definitely requires more rigour. Mm. Um, we have engaged with other sectors that have similar central fund um, setups uh, in Australia and also looked at some of our um, emerging funds specific for news purposes internationally. That being said, taking on board your concerns about how it's administered, et cetera, as Christy has said, would be worthy of further investigation. But in the meantime, PG has put forward two options that we see would, would support a start-up economy for news media. One, looking at philanthropic incentives. We all know that the philanthropic sector often provides that early seed or risk capital for non-profit start-ups and would certainly um, be a way of encouraging different types of business models in the news media sector. The not-for-profit news sector in Australia is relatively small to other countries. And then secondly, we've also put forward um, a body of research around an industry rebate scheme. Yes, well, that's what I want to go to, because I think uh, given that we've had extensive experience with the R&D tax concession, we do have a body of knowledge and a substantive administrative practice to support that. Uh, so, uh, Professor Fells, or anyone else for that matter, if you could uh, please, for the benefit of the hand side, um, and I've, because I, I would like to just indicate to you I'm particularly interested in this matter, mm. if you could outline how you see such a proposal working and how it would be distinguished from the R&D tax concession as it currently operates, uh, if you could advise the committee on that matter to begin with. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Senator. So, as I said, PG has undertaken a body of research. We commissioned the Centre for International Economics to look at the potential of an, an R&D style rebate uh, for the news industry, and also guidance on how we would go about how to go about implementing such a scheme. Based on our reports modelling. It suggested it could have a significant positive investment impact. So the conservative analysis around a 25% um, ratio uh, returned over, as I said, over 350 million per annum mm -hmm. in benefit. Now, we would say that since we've produced that re that initial um, research and modelling, of course, we've now had the benefit of the news media bargaining code. Um, now having been legislated, and whilst that legislation is dormant, what we have seen it is has incentivised uh, digital platforms to enter into commercial deals, multi-million dollar deals that are um, multi-year as well. And so we have this new revenue stream that's coming through. PG does acknowledge that the purpose of the News Media Bargaining Code was to address um, market, power, market power imbalance, it doesn't have an obligation for any of the news media players to reinvest those funds for public interest journalism outcomes. So we would see that the benefit of the tax rebate is to tie those complementary outcomes back towards investment in public interest journalism, which is the underlying public good that we're seeking to support and sustain. OK, well, there's a couple of issues. Um, as you know, I've got... Uh a deep, uh, quite a long history of engagement on the R&D tax concession and the changes to it that the previous government introduced. So first of all, does your calculations take into account the changes to the uh, tax incentive that were announced in the 2020 budget? I'd need to take that on notice. Our modelling right. was done in late 2019, so we would need yes, to okay. take adjustments. In fact, I might... Um, obviously, might, that's subsequent. OK, maybe I'll ask another question. Would it be possible for you to give us a supplementary submission? I know time's short because we're, we're starting to write our report. But if you could give us a supplementary submission outlining this proposal in plain English uh, and taking into account later developments, because the figures that you've quoted on the 350 million are, I think, a little different from those that are contained in your original submission. And I, have I understood that correctly? 
We had a spectrum in our original research, yeah, yeah. so it was, a, it was a spectrum upper and lower. Okay. So if you could perhaps provide us with, uh, if you'll, Madam Chair, if you think that's suitable? <laughs> yes, that's, that's fine. I, I, we're asking for you to take this on notice, of course. So, yes, yes, yes. Um, and and look, just, this is the specific question, though. The R&D tax concession actually excludes the humanities. That, that's the point. It's, it's for a different purpose. And you cannot get support for, for that type of creativity, if you like. Uh, and that it's, type of innovation. Yeah, well, that type of innovation, but that's, it, it's a creative... It's funding creativity in technological change. Mm. It's got to be new to industry. Mm. It's, there's a number of criteria. The proposal you have here would set a new criteria... That would be the difficulty in trying to uh, develop this, this model. I would ask if you could pay particular attention to what would the criteria be that would need in terms of any legislative change so that it would be clear... I mean, if we were to argue this case in any subsequent report, because uh, this is one of the uh, practical measures that's come before this committee and it needs to be clear as to what can be done within the... Ex within the taxation system. Then there's the question of access to it. And the beauty of this proposal is that you've actually got to spend money to get money. And you can actually devise a scheme so that you can be in tax loss. You don't actually need to be in a profit to secure a benefit. Uh, so it has a number of attractions to it, but you'll need to define the taxation system needs to be able... or the, the scheme will need to be defined in such a way as to ensure that it was I think defensible. what Senator Carr is asking for is, A, a an update on the proposal that you've already sent to us with um, uh, understanding the new kind of um, figures and data that you have, but specifically to go to what types of amendments may be required to enable a criteria like this to actually uh, be taken up. And defended. And defended. And, and in particular also, sorry, and then the additional matter is you're saying that the mandatory bargaining code you're suggesting could provide you with some model, uh, a variation on the scheme, but that only applies to companies that are actually existing. And what you do need to do is try to find new entrants. If we're to change the nature of diversity, uh, in fact, broaden the level of diversity, <laughs> You, we need to find a mechanism that actually encourages new investment into the media industry in this country. Uh, I, I think it's fair to say that even uh, Mr Thompson's uh, um, evidence from News Corp earlier this morning said um, diversity only exists if there is sustainability within the, uh, the, the landscape. So I, I guess... Um, yeah. We're trying to find a way to... Well, that's sure. exactly what we're trying to do. Exactly. So there's no good... Um, and Professor Feltz, I know you've spoken at length about this matter in particular, about the question of concentration. It is the case that we probably do have one of the highest levels of concentration in the world. Would you agree? Yes. So was that addressed to me or to Mr. Professor Feltz? Well, Professor Feltz, I want to obviously trying to get him in on the action here, but <laughs> uh, I, it just seems to me that we're bit, that, that proposition's been challenged. Uh, obviously, we're looking to ensure that that... that, uh, that, that the evidence is clear on, you know, do we have the highest concentration uh, of terms of print media in the, in the world? And secondly, what mechanisms can we recommend for a change in that situation? That's the point we're trying to, to develop. So it's very high international standards uh, of OECD countries. Um, as to mechanisms, I've got one I can talk about with a little bit of knowledge. That is, we have merger laws, um, but the competition merger laws only operate within an industry. So if there's a newspaper merger, that's covered. Um, but if there's a cross-media merger, generally uh, the competition law doesn't stop it. Uh, and then that gives rise to the issue, should there be some kind of test that goes beyond the competition <laughs> and some kind of diversity test or a public interest test. Uh, now, in the 
Productivity Commission report on it many years ago, they said, yes, there should be a public interest test, which would include criteria like diversity, pluralism, and so on. And I think the Convergence uh, Review reached a similar conclusion. It was left a little bit up in the air who made that uh, decision about diversity, but from memory, it was in the Productivity Commission case, they said the ATRIP, there are pluses and minuses to, to that. Uh, there's a general belief that those cross-media ownership restrictions didn't work terribly well and were somewhat outdated. It was better have a general public interest done by an independent regulator. Okay. And finally, it doesn't, under the competition law, there's no divested power. You can't break up uh, someone who you think is too concentrated. We just don't have that in our law. Um, also a bit hard if they're a foreign entity, I, su I suspect. Yes, there could be, yes, additional problems. Mm. Um, could I ask, just following on from this issue, because this is the crux of uh, a lot of the issues we're talking about in terms of media diversity. Um, in your opening uh, statement, um, Dr Raffin identified that there were, the, the figures that you had was that there were 232 contractions and 110 expansions over the, I suspect, I, I understood that to be over the last 12 months, but perhaps we just need that clarified. Um, what has, could we unpack that a little bit in, in terms of uh, the impact that that's had then on the concentration of media ownership and even things like the copy that is being received uh, by audiences and uh, readers and communities across the country? Um, could we just have a little bit of a sense of, of what those figures actually mean in on the ground? Sure. So thank you for the question, um, Senator. So just to confirm, what we were what we're capturing is aggregate data since the database commenced, which was the first of January 2019. Mm -hmm. What we've seen, um, so that's effectively. Uh, coming up to three-year mark at the end of December this year. Um, but what we have seen is the majority of activity has taken place since COVID hit, and we take that date at the end of March last year. Um, and roughly that's where we've seen the highest concentration of changes, definitely skewed um, on a basically a one-thirds to two-thirds to regional in terms of um, impact of in decline. As to what that looks like in terms of concentration, what this data doesn't show is actually baseline continuing news production. And we're actually in the process at the moment of compiling that data so that we'll be add, able to add the baseline data to these changes. And then we'll have a greater understanding of what the health of news production availability actually looks, looks like across communities across Australia. So it's been put to us previously that, uh, particularly in uh, the rural and regional areas um, across the eastern seaboard in particular, um, thinking um, uh, New South Wales and Queensland, uh, that uh, the contractions uh, and uh, a number of the kind of um, new ownerships has meant we've got ma local mastheads now being owned by news corporation, um, as opposed to kind of smaller independent uh, local uh, news outlets. And that, that uh, effectively is that uh, those communities are simply receiving the same lot of copy and information and news as what is being printed in the Daily Telegraph or in the Courier Mail. Uh, it is just syndicated uh, up and down the eastern seaboard. Is, is, is that what your data shows, or you don't have that granular um, uh, access at this point? 
So certainly we do look at that type of indicator in order to ascertain the type of change that we're seeing. Uh, as we've observed trend towards digital, which should surprise no one, what we're also seeing is an increase in syndicated data. Um, that's not unique to any one news producer. It, you know, certainly we've seen that across all major news producers. It's, they're looking for economies of scale in news production um, during a period of, of contraction. Um, with regard to getting granular detail and some um, strong case studies inside particular communities and how that may be affecting the level of local content for that, con for that community's uh, public interest needs, we're actually doing a pilot in the new year subject to securing funding, looking at eight communities across outer metro, regional and rural, in order to give set that methodology of assessing the impact it has on communities and to add greater richness um, that can then be expanded across different regions of Australia and understanding what media diversity currently looks like in order to inform the discussion around what it should, like, mm. should look like. I mean, ultimately, we're all looking for what the optimal outcome is. So just to be clear, you may have a... Um, a, a an outer metro or a rural or regional area may still have um, a, a local newspaper, whether that's online or um, uh, in hard copy. Um, but if that news is syndicated <laughs> up and down the eastern seaboard, how do we ensure that we're still talking about media diversity here? Just because there is a, a dozens of different mastheads, um, uh, if they're all receiving the same... Uh, copy uh, is that diverse, or is, is or is uh, at what point does syndication play into this discussion? I guess is what we're trying to unpack here. So look, we need to think about the levels of syndication as well. So there's obviously a spectrum, and we're not mm. suggesting by any means that um, masters are 100% syndication. Um, we have seen some indications um, where that may have been a temporary uh, service delivered through COVID. And we've got to remind ourselves too that the news business is shifting dramatically over the last 18 months. So what was put in place in terms of temporary services, we're now starting to see a slight rebound since the middle of this year as the economy starts to stabilise. With regard to that granular detail of... Uh, examination of mass heads and actually looking at the percentage of content that is syndicated versus genuine local content, that is very much part of the intention of that pilot project next year mm -hmm. to take eight sample communities and actually see what that looks like. Mm -hmm. um, and there's several clusters of university research uh, proposals that are then looking to come in behind that and expand it. Mm -hmm. Um, but it is critical data that's missing. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr Fells, uh, you've referenced uh, the um, pros and cons, or that there are pros and cons, you didn't go into detail, of uh, uh, the role of the ACCC in some of these discussions about media concentration. You've talked about the need for public interest test uh, in relation to merger laws um, and the cross-media ownership laws. Uh, I'm just wondering whether you've got any thoughts to reflect on this issue of um, the impact of syndication uh, in the competition space? Um, surely this isn't just unique to the media sphere. I mean, if, if the same product is being uh, produced by the same company, yet they stick a different name on it and fill all the shelves, um, you know, <laughs> surely that raises a question of, of uh, competition policy. Um, it's certainly not irrelevant, um, but I would uh, venture to uh, suggest that probably in actual me media mergers and so on, it, it probably wouldn't be a swing factor one way or the other. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and is there anything else you'd like to add in relation to um, these, the comments you made about uh, specific areas that would need to be looked at in relation to the merger laws um, or the role of the ACCC, uh, um, 
there is a call for um, a broader type of judicial inquiry or a royal commission into these issues. Um, we've seen the Productivity Commission touch on some of it. There's been you know, Finkelstein review. We've mentioned that today. Um, I guess what? where do we go from here? Uh, is it that, oh, well, it's just set and we move on and try and deal with this? Or is there actually a process and a legitimate space to, to talk about um, how these things are, uh, the, the regulations that are set um, to date? Uh, okay, one is uh, the ACCC happens, or at least the chair of it, recently recommended some tightening of the merger law mm. um, avenue to go down, and the changes suggested by him would have a slight impact on this situation. But the point I'd like to make is that uh, we think it would be really useful if all the parties prior to the forthcoming election, had a media policy statement and one that went a bit beyond saying there ought to be an inquiry of some form or other. Uh, that would be a real step forward. Senator Carr, have you got any of your follow-up questions? No, I'm not. No? Much. Has anybody else got anything um, uh, in particular to, to add uh, or to comment on uh, whether it's from uh, in relation to questions from myself or Senator Carr? Yes, I have one brief comment about the digital platforms law. Um, you, you're referring to the media code? Yeah, the media code. Yep. Um, and uh, it's just that um, it's not very transparent. It's even less transparent uh, because it's not been um, designated anyone. Mm. But even then, we don't really know much about how much money is going to who and who's missing out and more basically what are the criteria for allocation and what factors are mm. looked at and so on. So we, we just wanted to mm. say much better if there's a whole lot more transparency there. Yes. Um, and to that point, of course, um, I think the, the clock is ticking towards uh, the 12-month review. So I think, there's, uh, I think that's meant to be February or March next year. So the, um, uh, that is an issue to be raised and um, an issue to be interrogated through that process, I believe. Yes, indeed. Mm. Do you look like you know you find Senator Rag? Okay. Well, thank you all very much for uh, your time today. I know we've asked um, a few things to be put on notice and some supplementary submissions, so we really appreciate your time um, uh, today and uh, the time you'll give us in uh, getting back to us as well. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, we have our uh, last witness for uh, the day, and I think we have them um, on the line. Um, Mr Ellen and uh, Mr Thomas from the Country Press Australia. Just checking that we've got Mr Thomas there, or is it...? Good, good afternoon. It's, it's Bruce Ellen speaking. OK. Uh, Paul Thomas won't be joining us today. Is it...? Is it he, he won't be? No, he won't be. Um, I, I'm, I'm representing Country Press okay. Australia. All right. We felt to have a one rather than have a, a to and fro between fair, a number of people. Fair enough, Mr Ellen. Thank you very much. Well, um, I will uh, officially welcome you uh, to um, appear uh, before us today. I understand information on parliamentary privilege uh, has been and protection of witnesses and evidence has been provided to you. For the Hansard record, Mr Ellen, could you please state your full name and the capacity in which you appear today? Uh, uh, Bruce Charles. Ellen, I appear in the capacity as a board member of Country Press Australia. I was also the president of Country Press Australia up until June 30th. So um, I was part of our committee that was designated by our board of directors um, to be involved with a variety of inquiries over the last uh, two years. Okay, thank you so much. Um, Mr Ellen, do you have an opening statement you'd like to give us? 
Yeah, thank you, Senator. I do. Uh, largely, I will uh, refer to our submission, which dates back to January of this year, which is quite amazing. <laughs> I had to actually go back and reread it myself. Um, the yeah, Country Press Australia, we welcome the opportunity to appear uh, before the, the Senate of Inquiry. Um, it's the state of media diversity, uh, independence and reliability in Australia, and the impact this has on public interest, journalism and democracy. So Country Press Australia is the industry body that represents the interests of over 180 regional and local newspapers across Australia. Our members are most often, and in some cases, the only provider of local news for their communities. Our member newspapers publish local news content in both printed and online formats, utilising a variety of platforms to engage audiences. But the printed newspaper remains the primary source of revenue for our members to support the production of public interest journalism. I guess in summary, I would say that the membership of Country Press Australia is probably the epitome of what a diverse media landscape actually looks like in Australia. A submission that has discussed the significant impact of revenue decline, fine for public interest journalism, and it must be considered through the imperatives of our members in wanting to sustain commercial viability and a service to their local, regional and local communities. The fragile nature of the viability of regional and local newspapers was highlighted by a large number of newspaper closures during the first stages of COVID-19, mm -hmm. and this has only been exacerbated. Uh, however, there's, as both um, our previous um, speakers suggested, there are green shoots um, in the media environment and certainly some of the questions that were posed both by both senators are very, very relevant. And I had to bite my tongue to actually stop jumping in. <laughs> and I'm certainly happy to feel those similar sort of questions from you again, simply because um, we work at the grassroots level. level. As an example, um, I'm, I'm a publisher of a number of newspapers, but this morning I was out taking photographs of people around our town to run a community campaign to encourage fully dosed vaccinations in our region. So we are hands on in terms of granular. You don't get much more than Country Press Australia and our membership. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ellen. Um, I think uh, we're obviously happy to hear uh, your um, um, a response to uh, some of those issues that we've raised with other witnesses. So. Um, feel free to, to, to jump in and, and, and add that. Um, I just wanted to get a bit of a baseline of uh, what your membership looks like at this point, because as you, you've appeared before this committee before, but in, uh, in under other inquiries. Um, I'm interested to know uh, what you've, you've talked about membership being some uh, a combination of online and print. Do you have a... Um, uh, would you be able to give us the percentage of that or uh, an overview of what that looks like? And um, I assume that has changed uh, and has grown in, in, uh, towards online uh, over recent years, but if, I'd just like to understand the, the breakup. So, in fact, virtually all our, all our members have a printed version as part of their business model. Mm -hmm. um, most of those people would also have uh, some fairly highly advanced websites and online presence and also social media platforms as well they run on, but all our members uh, do produce printed versions of, mm -hmm. their, of their local newspapers. Mm -hmm. And have uh, your members uh, been able to access the news media bargaining code? Yeah, look, so um, CPA, Country Press Australia, has negotiated on behalf of members with the digital platforms. The ACCC uh, were very supportive in authorising us to act collectively. And yes, we have been successful in negotiating with both platforms. The finalisation uh, for a legal sense of that is yet to be completed, 
Um, but we are, we are fairly comfortable that um, a resolution is not far away that will benefit all our members who fit within a, we think, quite reasonable criteria in a broad sense. Mm -hmm. um, just so that we're clear, because you gave your submission to us at the beginning of the year, and thank you for that. This inquiry has been working long and hard, and we've had a variety of different um, witnesses. Uh, would you be able to, on notice, just give us a, the most updated list of your members uh, so that we know uh, we can, what the landscape looks like? Certainly, but I can make a comment around that if you would like. Yes. Um, I think you asked um, both our previous speakers about uh, what the uh, academic numbers me actually mean <laughs> on the ground. <laughs> so, uh, it has been a great, very interesting time, I've got to say. Uh, you would well be aware that News Box shut down regional Queensland um, for their own good reasons. Um, we believe they abandoned their regional communities. They put back in a couple of journalists that did some online, um, online filling of content. But largely, uh, it's our view of what we observed that largely all they're doing is trying to drive audiences through their regional URLs into the Metro papers, which um, quite clearly is not in the, um, the realms of what media diversity should look like. Mm. The result of that has been though, that numerous independents have started up in the areas that News Corp abandoned. Um, those independents are putting journalists into the ground, into the regions that they operate in. And uh, to date, um, the communities have accepted them very, very well. Um, and so in terms of our memberships, our memberships numbers have grown during the time simply because we now have more independents that are operating and they see Country Press as the as the body that represents them uh, in numerous ways and this, I guess, is one of them. Uh, so our membership is growing um, recently substantially during the last uh, 18 months. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and did uh, any of your members receive PING funding over the last... 18 months or so? Yes, we did receive PIN funding. Um, however, we we have put numerous submissions into government. We believe the way the PIN funding was distributed was an absolute disgrace. Um, it ignored the intent of the original regional Port publishers fund from where the government uh, got the majority all that funding from. In reality, there was $30.4 million that we remained in a pool for regional and small publishers, and it had been allocated to regional and small publishers. The government decided they would use that $38.4 million and add a paltry $11 million to spread across a much wider range of publications, including some large corporates, with the result that the people being small published, who were the originally intended recipients of that funding, less than 15% of the amount that had previously been allocated to them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in answer to your question, yes, we did get pink funding, but it was well below the levels that we had been promised. Mm -hmm. and we can't get any traction in terms of any additional funding. And if you compare the $11 million of new money mm -hmm. that Media Australia received, regional airlines got $300 million <laughs> in new funding. <laughs> now, you can have a view on that. Our view is that uh, in terms of our communities, our members and our newspapers and our news gathering and public interest journalism is worth a lot more than one thirtieth that of flying on a regional airline. Mm -hmm. um, Senator Carr. Yes, look, we just a uh, couple of points that just exemplify the points you're trying to make. Um, so your proposition was that in Queensland, 
The closure by News Limited of the regional newspapers actually was aimed at channeling audience share into the metropolitan areas. That's essentially the submission you're making, isn't it? Well, I'm, I'm saying that is my view of what the intent appears to have been, if you look at... That's the effect. ...the actual website. Yeah, OK. So, uh, did that happen anywhere else? Have you seen with any of the other closures? Have you seen that pattern emerging in any of the other states? Look, uh, the, there's a, a massive difference in the states in terms of the new for influence in different states. In Victoria, we are prominently an independent family-owned newspaper uh, market. Um, News Corp uh, has, does not have um, as much of a presence mm. at all in mm. Victoria. So there's been virtually no impact in Victoria. OK. And your contention New is South, that... Sorry, if I continue, New sorry. South Wales... Um, ACM, Australian Community Media, they are a large player in, in New South Wales regional media. Uh, you'd be aware they have also um, chosen to uh, suspend or close some of their publications in New South Wales as well. Um, and I, I don't have really a, enough knowledge to say what their strategy is. And you can say the same in South Australia, where a similar thing has happened. Uh, ACM had a, a significant um, uh, presence in South Australia mm. uh, and in Queensland we've already discussed. So it's a, it's a state by state consideration yes, yes. in terms Thank of... Thank you. And that's what I was looking for. I'm sorry I cut you short. I thought you were finished. But you, you further put the view to us that your members, for very few of your members closed. Now, it, it, did I understand that correctly? Very few That's of you. Correct. No, okay. Now, why do you think that is? What's your view as to what the, the explanation for that is? Well, my view, and I've expressed this very clearly to other people in the past, is um, while we are businesses and we certainly need to be sustainable commercially, we weren't driven by a profit motive to produce news for our community. Mm, I see. At a time when our community needed us most, mm. to say, sorry, commercially this isn't good for us, to close our door, mm. would have been an absolute height of hypocrisy. Our communities were next day, well, what's going to happen next? The local newspaper's gone. They've got to cut off our water next, cut off our power next. What's going to happen now? Mm. Mm. It was our responsibility to look after our communities mm. through the COVID pandemic. So... You then go on to say, look, there's some green shoots or the new um, um, enterprises have, have opened up uh, in some of these uh, regional areas. Can you give us some examples of where they've, where these uh, new publications have emerged and have been successful? Look, so I'll, I'll declare a, a bit of a, not a conflict of interest, but an no, interest. No, but any interest doesn't in matter. I, if you've got direct knowledge, um, even better. Right? Just, OK, just, so it is. Um, I'm, I'm an independent publisher, and a couple and a couple of other independent publishers, when um, News Corp made this decision, we decided that there was an opportunity for us to service those communities by opening up a regional newspaper in particular markets. So, our first newspaper that we opened as a group, and I, I say this only because this is personal knowledge, is other people have done exactly the same thing. We first started off in Kingaroy. We then moved to Gympie. We then went to Rockhampton, uh, Bundaberg, Gladstone. Um, we're currently Ipswich. Um, so a variety of, of large Queensland towns. And we also have operations that were partly in existence in, or were in existence in Noosa and Warwick, which are also associated with our, with our small group. OK. So is it your contention that there are still opportunities for new investment and new uh, titles, new, new mastheads to open in this environment? That, that's a fantastic question. And obviously, um, we, we think there is. However, um, a lot of independents who have commenced, I think... Um, uh, Christy Hess alluded to this, and maybe Anna did as well. Some of those entrants have gone in 
probably undercapitalized and not really understanding what the newspaper business looked like. And they, some of those actually folded. Mm. Um, and I would say part of that was because News Corp decided to relaunch publication in Mackay mm -hmm. and on the Sunshine Coast. Yeah, okay. So that's what I'm trying to get to here. Um, you know, because the, the dominant uh, narrative is that opportunities are limited. You know, there is just the end of the publishing year, if you like. You know, revenues driving up, you know, advertising revenues driving up, that it's, um, you know, it's almost a philanthropic exercise to undertake publication of newspapers in regional communities. Uh, people basically have to volunteer to do it. Is is you, you know what I'm mentioning here? This is I totally know what you're talking about. You're yeah, familiar no. with this line of argument? And you're saying yes, it's, it's commercially viable to do it, but that there have been examples, and you say that there are a number of reasons why they've failed, where it's demonstrated that uh, it's not a guarantee of success. I think that states the case pretty pretty carefully. There is no guarantee of success. success. We put our uh, next on a chopping chopping block as it was, yeah. as it were. Um, but there are opportunities, but it's a tough market. Yeah, yeah. The COVID market for commercial advertising is very very difficult. Yes. Okay. Are you also saying that the the existing operators are prepared to undertake actions to make sure you're not successful? No, look, I, no, I wouldn't. I, I think it's probably presumptuous of me to suggest that. I'm just giving you an example of what happened in the Mackay market. OK, so that's what I... I'm trying to get to understand your evidence. In the Mackay market, do you believe that the re-establishment of an old masthead was a contributing factor in the failure of the new venture? That is certainly my view. Mm -hmm. And have there been any other examples where that's occurred? Uh, look, not that I'm aware of. OK. Well, in regard to the bargaining code, uh, do you think there's... A, is it your contention that, um, that the distribution of money was fair, particularly so in regard to bargaining... regional publications? OK. So the, the bargaining code was something we spent two years working on in terms of the initial development of the digital platforms inquiry. Um, and I guess, um, as Professor uh, Alan Fells um, noted, uh, we really don't know exactly where we stand in terms of mm. a relative uh, division okay. of funds between regional and, so, and metro markets. Just to, be, just to be clear there, my understanding, and perhaps you can clarify this, is that the, confident, the commercial in confidence uh, clauses in the contracts uh, are very strict. So that, that, that's correct. Mm -hmm. All right. So, notwithstanding that, do you have any other indications to suggest that local newspapers got a fair cut of the deal? Look again. Um, the indications we have received. And that's, I, was on a, I was on a conference call um, to Miami two days ago to to discuss. The, the code that we implemented in Australia. And while figures of revenues were not discussed, the overwhelming wisdom seems to be that Australia did relatively well compared with the rest of the world because of the way the government and the ACCC uh, mandated a code. So uh, all I can say is that um, we had robust negotiations with the platforms and we were reasonably comfortable with the outcome, which had yet, yet to be finalised from a legalistic perspective, but the framework of them we were reasonably comfortable with. In terms of asking me how that sits relative to News Corp and Nine, I just couldn't make any well, judgment it's on that. It's not possible to tell. OK. But then on the PIN uh, money, you're suggesting that you do have an understanding of that and you're not happy that AAP got... Um, the share of money they did, you think that was disproportionate? Is that correct? I certainly do. All right. They're very much so. Now, ha on the other hand, isn't it the case that AAP is absolutely critical to providing a news source 
for a, as a wire service is an absolutely critical to support your members providing a new service to local communities. I simply do not agree with that proposition at all. Right. Why, that, why is that? I know, I know that AAP put that proposition, but media diversity is all about employing local journalism in local markets to write local stories. That's what our members do. OK. But it's also about providing a range of news services too for local audiences. It's, you, you, you argue that it's about diversity of opinion within the publication as well as between the publications. Correct. Isn't that true? So, I mean, if uh, you're... I do. In, yes, I do. Correct. Yeah, okay. I do. That's okay. that exactly right. So, so, yeah. so isn't it equally valid for readers in a regional community to have access to a broader source of news, uh, such as that that's provided by AAP, on issues that go beyond just local news stories? I, I, I don't dispute that, that uh, contention at all. Okay. However, yeah. I do dispute the amount of funding they got, which was outside the grant. The grant. Um, but I would also add that that diverse media for your generic stories that AAP write is available through various platforms. Like it's what? available through the ABC online. It's available through oh, news see. online. So you think it's if you rewrite online. the... A but, but to be clear about that, you're saying you can rewrite the ABC online and that's OK? No, no, I'm not saying that at all. No, no, I'm saying... The success of, if we have success in regional areas, it's because we write about local stories. We hold local people in power to account. Yep, yep, yep. So we have a different, we have a different mantra in terms of what we do. But if our community wants to get a broader perspective on world news, national news, there are plenty of other sources okay. available I, outside. I, I, I think I understand your view. I, I'm just wondering whether or not you can contain within one publication a diversity of, of views, particularly of important news that relates to local community that may not be locally generated. Look, I think um, that, that, that's, a, that's an excellent point. Um, if, if there's a, a piece of news that has a direct impact on our local communities, our members will cover that on a local basis. Hmm. And But the reality is that our newspapers are already full of local news stories hmm. and there's an economy of, I guess, diminishing returns in terms of hmm. what is more important to our community. The local stories that nobody else tells but us or national news stories that they can get from a variety of other platforms. Yeah, I, yeah. I think I, I see your line of argument. I'm just, you know, I'm just trying to explore that a bit more. Okay. Now, just finally, then, because um, you've indicated that there's money remaining in the fund. How much do you think is there? So the um, well, I, I, if I, I indicated that an, the original regional sport publishers fund was set up, I think some four years ago, um, because of the changes to media ownership laws at the time. This was a fund that Senator Xenophon pushed. Yeah. Um, $50 million was allocated at that stage. Of that amount, $38.4 million was unallocated. Yeah. What happened to that $38.4 million? It was pushed into the $50 million ping fund. Yeah. But it was distributed to broadcasters, Southern Cross got $10 million out of that, ACM got $10 million out of that, and I could go on. Yeah. But the upshot was the original, the originally intended recipients of that fund only got 11, sorry, only got 15% of the original okay. $38.4 million that was allocated to them. No worries. I thank you very much for that because I think we're going to have to ask, Madam Chair, if we could get... Um, uh, secretary to follow up yes. a, a breakdown of where that money's been spent. Mm -hmm. I think that's quite important for mm -hmm. our report. Um, but particularly, though, is there any money left over that you're aware of? Not that I'm aware of, Senator, no. OK. So it's been put to me that there might be about $6 million um, 
still in the fund. You're not, are you familiar with anything of that? Would that make any sense to you at all, that sort of number? It makes no sense to me at all. all right. I'm not okay. saying it does, but we're certainly not aware of it. Well, it's just that... It, 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 I'm not trying to be a smart uh, Alec here, but it's referred to in your submission, right? Um, that's where we oh, get sorry. it. Sorry, OK, so look, perhaps... Sorry, perhaps I can revisit that there. Right? Yeah, sorry, I, I don't... That's a sorry, I'm not just... Can you no, have a look please, at it again? Please, no. Uh, there's, there is a reference in your submission to a fund, the remaining uh, money. Now, that doesn't make... Because as you say, you, you put your submission in a while ago and it might not be there and all you know more about it than I will. Uh, no, certainly. Look, thank you for raising that as an issue, though. So, yeah. I think referring to... What, what I was referring to then was a fund that was associated with a regional small publishing fund, right. which was a cadetship fund. Yeah. Oh, the cadets. It's my okay, belief okay. $6 well, that's, that clears that up. That clears that up. Yeah, okay. So the question then is, um, if there's this cadetship money there, uh, do you reckon that there could be an indication, we could get an indication from the government as to how they're going to spend it? Look, Senator, I'm not convinced it is there anymore. I believe they rolled that into the $50 million ping funding. Well, we better find that out. That would be useful for However, to find out. Yeah. Yes. Go on. But one of the things, one of the things that has happened, I guess, since my the application is that you'd be aware the government allocated uh, hundreds of millions of dollars to a to apprenticeship support. Right. Now, um, I have put numerous. We have put numerous submissions into the treasurer and to the minister communications to ask. But what about our apprentices? Our apprentices are obviously. Our cadets, and to me, it's a no-brainer that if we want media diversity, it's not bad reference, huh? yeah, yep. and we want young people to enter the industry and grow through it, and help employ a greater number and variety of journalists. Surely, an apprenticeship program for newspapers, being simply our cadets, should be put in place. I made the point that this was already in place and worked very, very well, but it was abandoned. Mm. Uh, it strikes me that perhaps we might have the same problem, that the criteria for apprenticeship doesn't include uh, the creatives or the humanity-style uh, issues, as opposed, uh, similar to what Senator Carr was raising about the R&D funding. Correct. I think that's right, Senator. Mm. Yes. yes. But, it's but not having a... said that, I couldn't get a response back from anybody about why, why not. OK. Mm. But you would welcome a recommendation to that effect. Most definitely, I think it's it's a it's a it's a it's low hanging fruit. It's it's relatively inexpensive thing, and it is co-funded. We're not asking for hundred percent wages to be paid for seeking co-funding. Yeah, and I think co-funding is the way to go with a lot of these issues. So you've got to put money in to get money out. So so, so th there's the previous fund. So um, provide a certain percentage of wage subsidy, but it didn't make it so that members could... I couldn't say raw statistics, because our members wouldn't do that. They wouldn't do that, yes, I got that. You got that, yes. Thank you. Thank got that quick, you quickly, yes. It does mean that there has to be uh, an equal bargain between the, the funder, if it's the government, and the business, the private business enterprise to, you know... Um, put a skin in the game as well. Fair enough. Now, can you recall what that percentage was? Sorry, I can't offhand. If would you could take able... a note. Yes, yeah. so if you could take that on notice, that would be helpful. We might be able to get the Secretariat to that, find that, that, fix, out. that fixes me. Thank yeah. you very okay. much. Okay. Thank you All very right. much. Thank you, Mr Ellen. I appreciate your time and, uh, and your submission earlier in the year. And now we've been able to bookend uh, for this inquiry and your participation. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Okay. That concludes today's proceedings. I'd like to thank all of the witnesses who have given evidence to the committee today, as well as Hansard Broadcast and the Secretariat staff. Thank you very much, and we'll wind it up there.